Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Electric Live. Joining me are the developers behind 1CC Games, where, we'll be, where we will be discussing Star Hunter DX, Space Moth DX, and also their upcoming Space Moth Lunar Edition. Welcome to the stream, you guys. Oh, hi, Mike. Thanks for having us. Yeah, and so hi, why don't hi, you... Hi. I'll let you two sort of introduce yourselves real quick. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm James. I'm the programmer at 1CC Games, and Dan and I both collaborate on game design. Uh, yeah, I'm Dan, and <laughs> I mainly do the artwork and also some layout and the music for 1CC. And are you two the, the main people behind all the games? Are there other members of staff, or are you two kind of the, the main team? Um, 1CC Games is a, a small company, and we're the only members at the moment. But we have got uh, people from the Shmup community to help test our games. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. I remember. Yeah, I remember with uh, uh, Star Hunter DX, you were having people do a little bit of testing. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. I think I um, got I think I got to test a little bit, and I was probably yammering on about the damage or something. Like, add more enemies, decrease damage. That's always my, <laughs> my feedback on a lot of things. That, that's yeah. a good way to go. But lots of enemies with low HP make the player <laughs> feel powerful. Yes, exactly. Well, I thought it'd be great to get started by first kind of getting a backstory to you two as far as just your history with the genre, what games you were into when you were first getting into it, what kind of hooked you into shmups in the first place? Uh, well, okay, well, I'll go first on that one. Um, so I'm sort of really into arcade gaming in general, um, not just shmups, really. Um, but I certainly remember sort of playing 1942 and things like that back in the late 80s and early 90s, and uh, UN Squadron and things like that. So those were the f sort of early ones that I got into. Yeah, you can't go wrong with some UN Squadron, for sure. I saw the uh, guy did the one-handed uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. Uh, uh, Studio Mud Prince or Bullet Heaven. So many titles. I want to make sure I get the one right. But yes, uh, that was really cool. He did. He had that sort of special um, controller that they make for the SNES. I think he mentioned that it was originally made for RPGs, and so I could see that. But he uh, used it for a shmup, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so after that, like that. I mean. I don't know, Shmup sort of disappeared for a while. Like, I think I got out of video games for a bit and away from arcades, but then I got back into them when I got an original Xbox and MAME on it, and I discovered oh, yeah. Dodon Patchy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dodon Patchy was the one. It's like, oh, man, this is amazing. So, yeah. That's really cool. That's how I got into Shmups as well, is good old DDP. Yeah, yeah. Mame has uh, caves made a lot of money out of me because of Mame. <laughs> I know, right? Um, what about you, Dan? How did you get into shmups? So, so that was Dan's James. Just your turn. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm getting your voices confused. No, that was Dan. So James, how did you get into shmups? Oh well, I came uh, to, from kind of the the opposite end of the spectrum to Dan because um, um, I got into it through console gaming. Uh, my first console was a Mega Drive. Or a Genesis for everyone in America. Mm -hmm. um, and some of my favorite games in that were the Thunder Force series from Technosoft, uh, oh, especially yeah. Thunder Force 4, um, which is also a great game to bring up if anyone has a uh, SNES versus Mega Drive audio debate. You yeah, can just say, yeah. listen to Metal Squad. <laughs> That's now a great track. Think. Yeah, I still. Yeah, so, that, one's a, that one's a tough one for me because. There are certain things on the SNES that I love too, uh, soundtrack-wise. So I'm always a little bit divided on how I feel, but yeah, I, I kind of feel like um, for for rock and um, synth pop style things, like you'd get in the Sonic games, the the Meg Drive chip is really good. But yeah. for more atmospheric or orchestral stuff, yes. uh, that you'd get in RPGs and especially voice samples, yeah, the SNES is generally better. Yeah, I think that's how I feel as well. Because some of those SNES soundtrack or some of those SNES RPG soundtracks are amazing. My favorite is probably Super Mario RPG. That soundtrack because there's something so so like bright and cheerful about it in a fun way. 
And then um, I remember I used to stream that on Twitch, and I kept, but I kept getting uh, muted because uh, Nintendo wasn't having it, so I had to stop doing that. Oh no! <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of the um, Railroad soundtrack, Sunsnows. I'm um, especially Donkey Kong Country. Oh yeah, that's a killer soundtrack. That's a YouTuber favorite. Like you, you'll notice when you watch a lot of YouTube videos. That oh even, yeah, definitely. It's, even when it's people, one of those things. Yeah, aren't doing things remotely related to Donkey Kong, you'll hear the underwater theme <laughs> appearing. Like, what's that doing in here? <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. very, very chilled. Yes, and yes. Um, and I think that the whole game has interesting sound design, actually, because it's infuriatingly hard, or, or it would be if it had a typical platformer soundtrack. Right, yeah. Um, which is kind of driving you on. But it, the whole thing is just very chilled and dreamy and even a little bit gloomy in places. So despite the high difficulty, you can just keep on going and it never feels frustrating. You know what's an interesting aspect of that game design? This is arcade related, so it counts stream, that no one ever really comments on. Like you'll watch reviews, no one ever mentions it, but Donkey Kong Country is one of the first Nintendo platformers that I'm aware of that removed the timer. So all the Mario games have a timer, so you can't you you have some sort of motivation to hustle through the stages. But with Donkey Kong, there is no timer. I, th I always wondered maybe that's why Shigeru Miyamoto got mad at it. Like, He's like, where'd the timer go? What the hell is this crap? But yeah, maybe that, that also plays into the, the chilled, laid-back uh, atmosphere. It's like, hey, there's no timer here. There's no, harsh. there's no hurry. We can get through this however we need to. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I think um, that, that's a good point about the lack of timer. But I, I think uh, because it's... It's not quite a collectathon like Res later games, right? Right. Um, but it's it's going down that track. I think yeah. ha having uh, a timer would just make that element of the design really annoying if you had to poke around the levels and explore, but you knew that you couldn't take more than ten minutes. Or yeah, that's game a, over. That's a good. That's a really good point. I didn't even realize. Yeah, they do sort of begin that whole collecting thing, like where you get the little. Uh, animal pieces or whatever it is i'm a little fuzzy like the animal pieces then you get three of them you get to go to the bonus stage and all that stuff yeah definitely um, so, so back on the topic of genesis and shmups did you ever end up playing musha because that's probably my favorite genesis shmup yeah i did i'm um, not on uh, on a mega drive that was uh, through emulation a lot later yeah um, no, no but kidding. that also has a killer soundtrack <laughs> and it's super fast Yes. It's, it's not a really tough game, but it's very fun. I like it a lot. Yeah, that's that's a personal favorite of mine, Genesis-wise. Mm. Thunder Force 4 is also really up there, though. I like that one. And I think it's... I at least personally think that it's pretty clearly better than Thunder Force 3, but maybe that's just me. Uh, I, I personally prefer it to 3, but I can see why um, 3 has has a big following. It's, it's also great, and one thing I will say in its favor compared to 4 is that it has better pacing. It's it's a shorter and tighter game, and That's it true. starts with the difficulty quite high. Whereas on four, the first two stages are like um, they're kind of like parallax scrolling tech demos. To be honest, <laughs> it's like look yeah, at how well, many the... layers of water we can have. Look at our beautiful clouds, but there's not a huge amount going on. And then after yes. stage three, it really picks up. Yes, that is very true. I, what I always thought about the difficulty curve of Thunder Force 4 and maybe why I give it a little bit more leniency than I would ever an arcade shmup is because that I feel like Thunder Force 4 is Technosoft figuring out this is what a console shmup looks like like a 16-bit a console shmup where they have a, almost like a progression type system sort of like a, you're playing a Super Metroid or something like that it's the difficulty like you said is a little bit more stretched out compared to uh, arcade shmups and everything like that but I just think they nail those elements so strongly that it, I always think like, hey, if you want to make a really compelling console style shmup, U1 Squadron's up there, and I think Thunder Force is also Thunder Force Four is also really up there for that. Yeah, I think if it was turned into um, an arcade game, it would have to be trimmed down quite yes, a bit. Exactly, um, yes, exactly. Yeah, I I would personally like if I was making Thunder Force Four AC, I'd just begin from the stage where you get the. Um, the sword upgrade, right? Like the uh, the lightning sword version. Yes, that that's the beginning. We're just going to start right in the middle. Or you just very brief really then to fill you in on screen. Yeah, or really beef up those early stages, really get them get them cooking. Oh yeah, definitely. And also figure out some sort of scoring system, right? <laughs> Isn't the scoring system <laughs> in that game like really bare bones? 
I think the scoring system is you shoot the enemies and they blow up. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's been a while since I, I've played it, but I, I don't remember anything super deep going on with the scoring. Um, but like you said, it, uh, uh, it's more of a console shooter, so I can get away with that. I remember when the UN squadron appeared on the SNES, they they changed it from the arcade version. Yes. And it was single player only on SNES, and they did... It's like they redid some of the backgrounds and there was a couple of, I think, stages that were optional. I, I can't remember. But I remember not liking it as much as the arcade one. I, I remember thinking, why have they done this? Why have they removed the second player and stuff? So that, I think they tried to make that a console. My, console solution. My guess would be maybe that they had the second player and it was causing a bunch of slowdown or something on the SNES. Yeah, like, yeah, this maybe. This thing cannot it's handle two two players on the screen so we got to chop one out maybe yeah you know if you yeah. think about it a lot of the snes uh shmups are one player i don't think you can do two player in axelay either now that i think about it god that's me after a while yeah that's single player only isn't it yeah yeah so, so you guys a... got into so you guys got into shmups what stage did you start thinking about okay I want to start making shmups because that's a pretty big move that a lot of players obviously don't make. Well, we uh, we used to meet up in the um, the casino arcade in London. There was a group of us would meet there, and uh, that's where I met James. There was a group of about what uh, twelve or fifteen of us would meet on every Thursday night, and we'd have a shmup night and. People would lend the arcades boards and stuff. And we were just in there one night. We were just chatting and we thought, well, why don't we have just have a go at making a game? <laughs> it can't. How hard can it be? You know, it was yes. uh, <laughs> a very naive sort of thing to think about. <laughs> that's yeah, sort of Dan, Dan's right. We, we met in a casino arcade in the middle of London where there was a shmup club. And I think that that's when I got um, pretty seriously into shmups because before then they were, they were things I liked. Um, I guess I was more into them than a lot of people, so I would import them. I could a lot of imported Sinton and Dreamcast shmups. Right. Um, but I wasn't like uh, really into s scoring or um, going through stage strategies and things. Um, but then af after going to the the arcade and meeting up with Dan and other players there, I got more into the scene and started thinking about, well, I, I really enjoy playing games like this and I like programming, so why not have a go at making one? And then I won't have to wait around for people to uh, make the kind of shmup that I want. Right, exactly. Do it myself. So what was sort of the early stages of that journey? Like, what were your early attempts and what were the struggles that you ran up against? No, James, can you remember, what did we, did we do the casino caravan thing? Yeah, I'm just trying casino. to think, think of the very first game we made was, and I think uh, Dan, Dan's right, it was, we made in the casino arcade and then we made a little parody game called Casino Caravan Collection, which you can still play, I think, on our um, itch. IO page, um, and that's uh, a little score attack game, a caravan style shmup, where, where the background is a little pixel art rendition of the inside of that arcade. Oh, that's cool. Um, so it, it closed down a while ago, unfortunately, but it's been uh, enshrined there. So you, you too can virtually oh, visit Casino wow. Arcade in our first ever shmup. Now we got to talk about this a little bit. So what what happened with the arcade? Why did it close down? Oh god. Well, it was the 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 company that run it was Electrocoin and they were sort of they handled a lot of um big arcade games in the UK. They sort of worked with like Sega and stuff like that in the 80s. They were like a distribution thing. I think that is still going, but they had their own arcade. And um uh, was like in the basement of the arcade was just loads of proper, you know, proper arcade games upstairs. It was like uh, gambling machines. 
I think maybe just the rents got too high in London. I don't know really what happened, oh, but it just yeah. wasn't it wasn't making enough money, you know. Um, so it was really sad. But we, yeah, as James says, it does live on in Casino Caravan Collection, and the the boss, the the boss <laughs> in the game, is was the one of the engineers at the arcade who we would constantly have heated discussions about oh. change getting joysticks to work and right screens yes yeah t talking of the screen there was one the screen so we can actually see things yeah there's one particular screen a crt screen which was just never quite calibrated right um and a little joke in casino caravan collection is that when the um the boss character which like dan said is the engineer comes along, he's holding a broken CRT, and he fires an RGB beam at you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> now we got to check this game out, because it sounds it sounds really entertaining. <laughs> well, it, it's, um, yeah, it, you, it will entertain you. It, it might not keep you coming back for high schools for years, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's free, and it's a little piece of shmup history, so I hope everyone enjoys checking it out. Well, I've I'm, heard just across the board that, you know, Europe, Europe Arcade is a, a struggling venture. Like a lot of a lot of countries in Europe don't even have arcades anymore, and uh, oh, yeah, I felt like uh, you guys are in the UK, right? I always thought they had a little bit more of a solid arcade scene, just to, just from what I've seen. But are there still um, arcades I'm not out sure there? About... Oh yeah, there there are still arcades well, out there. Well, on, the, I... on the uh oh. Did we lose you? Just think we're both talking at the same time. Oh. <laughs> so James, you can answer that one. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I, I can't speak for the rest of Europe, um, but certainly in the arcade, a lot of smaller arcades um, have closed down, which is a shame. And obviously recently the um, whole coronavirus situation has not helped Right, arcades yeah. anywhere in the world yeah definitely um but what we are beginning to see a lot more of is um instead of arcades where you would smaller arcades where you'd go and it would have a traditional uh paper play point operated uh system we're just starting to see larger ones pop up where all of the machines are on free play and mm. they're almost um more like a, a day out so you go there and you pay, say, 10, 10 pounds or so. And then you can just play on everything. And some of them have um, pl places to eat inside as well and chill out zones. Ah, um, yeah. So one that I, I go to quite a lot is called the Heart of Gaming um, here in London. And then elsewhere in the country, there's a small chain called Arcade Club. And yeah, there's, they're kind of, um, or it seems to me, um, looking at things as a whole that they're being reinvented as, again, more like a, a day out because you you don't get, um, like say you would in Japan, just lots of little arcades everywhere. You can just pop into one whenever you're out, as long as you're in a fairly large city. That kind of um, approach doesn't work anymore because there simply aren't enough. You have to deliberately go to the arcade and it might be a bit of a journey. Right, and yeah. And then people will feel like it's not good value if you have traveled all of that way and then you're paying every time you need to play um, and then you need to leave the arcade to go and get some food and then come back again. And operators are beginning to see that. And so you're getting fewer arcades, but the ones that are there are larger. And it's mm. more of um, a, a day out venue. I, I think that's that's true in, in cities and stuff. If you go to the coast, you go to any coastal resort, it's full of arcades, just as it used to be. Um, when I was a kid growing up. The only difference is, is they're not full of like video games, they're just full of gambling machines and they're full oh, of geez. like Half the Dead 5 or you know, big showpiece games, <laughs> right, they still right. have those in them. Yeah, that, that's so, a good point. Um, I'm, I'm being slight, slightly elitist here in my definition of an arcade. Right, yeah, That's exactly. right, if you go to a, um, the, the, a seaside town where you'd traditionally expect there to be a lot of arcades, there are, but they sadly, are quite light on um, what I would think of as proper arcade games. I have a lot of um, those those coin pusher games or ticket redemption games, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's too bad. 
I remember growing up, the the big thing, yeah, we had actual dedicated arcades. Mine are still around, funnily enough. Um, they hang in there. But that I also remember, well, like, have, um... pizza shops, for instance, all had, like, yeah. pretty, pretty impressive arcades in there that you would get to go in and play. And so, like, every Sunday I'd go to the pizza shop with my family and play Ride In and Spy Hunter and all this different stuff. And I don't know if that's necessarily as much of a thing anymore. Where you go to a pizza shop and there'll be an arcade cabinet there. No, it, it definitely, it definitely isn't. That that's like gone. I mean, yeah, the, like in the eighties, uh, there was like a, a shop on our high street that sold Pepe jeans, and he had a he had a little back room, and it had international karate and Shaolin's Road in it. It was like so dodgy. It's like everyone was like chucking arcade machines in their shops, even yes. like regardless. Yeah, it was really weird because um, it was such a boom industry back then. But yeah, that's that's really gone. Yeah, they'd be everywhere. Even in the nineties, um, you'd still see like, a video game in a chip shop. But that's really rare now. I yeah, think. I've seen that for a long. Time. It's a shame. Yeah, I was, I was just but curious you know, to hear more well, about how it's going on in the UK as far as well, the, arcades. The, the other the other weird the other weird thing is that now, of course. So you go to an arcade, say at the seaside, where there's House of the Dead Five, and again you can't play it at home. <laughs> it's like because people don't bother porting those kinds of right. big yes. arcade games anymore. So it's like in a weird way, it's like oh, I really want to play this at home, but I can't because it's just not financially viable for them to port it anymore, or it's a, there's a special license or something. They just don't do that anymore. Yeah, and I think it was interesting during sort of the Dreamcast PS2 era. I remember for a while there, you know, having light gun games and everything like that was sort of an idea of a selling point, but it didn't really move consoles, I think, the way they expected. Because like you said, in the arcade, those were the money makers, right? You'd go to the arcade to play the light gun games and the racing games and that stuff. But when you translate that to home console, it just doesn't seem as popular. Yeah, I think well, I remember I bought a Dreamcast purely because of House of the Dead 2. I thought it was great, but I, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I always thought it thought it was successful, but maybe it, maybe it wasn't. Well, the Dreamcast uh, went down the yeah. They got it didn't make it. <laughs> it didn't make it through make its own it. lifespan. Yeah. Oh, it died a hero. I love the Dreamcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it went out in style at least. Dreamcast has some underrated games though, like um. There's this one game on there, a racing game I really like. It's I can't remember the name of it, so that's bad. But it's basically the predecessor to Project Gotham Racing, which came out on the Xbox. And I'm mm. a huge fan of that as well. But there's a predecessor to that. It's like Metropolis Racing or something like that on the yeah, Dreamcast. Metropolis Street Racing. Yeah, that's a cool game. It also had, they also had Cosmic Smash on it, which was a game I really wanted to love. I loved everything about it, but just never quite get to grips with it. So when you were making that, uh, yeah, that you know, that first shmup you made, and then after that, was your next shmup uh, Space Moth, or did you do some other, like, smaller projects? I think uh, Space Moth was the next one after that, yeah. Um, this is before it was Space Moth DX. Right, It's just yeah. plain old Space Moth. I remember plain old Space Moth. It was actually one of the very first indie shmups I was aware of, funnily enough. And I've come across it on this really tiny YouTube channel that I don't think exists anymore. Like, I'm sure you can find the channel, but I don't think they upload or anything like that. And it was just like this review of it. And they're like, yeah, Space Ma. <laughs> you know, it's not a great review, but I don't know. Something about that <laughs> caught my eye. Maybe because, you know, it, it has a sort of uh, Mushimi Sama vibe to it, obviously, with the bug theme and everything. I was like, oh, this is this is pretty cool. So I remember actually getting in on Space Moth pretty early, even though I wasn't really on the farm or anything at the time. It was one of the first Steam shmups I ever bought, actually. Oh, cool. Well, I'm, Thanks I'm buying you that. <laughs> <laughs> so what was... I want to know. I want to know the history of Space Moth and sort of making that happen, because I think making your first game, I, I assume, would be the, the biggest sort of undertaking, because not only are you making the game, but you're learning what the hell you're supposed to be doing alongside actually making it. Yeah, well, yeah it, it was definitely challenging. Um, 
Ben, do you want to go first? I have apologies. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll just say that we, we, yeah, we had this idea of making a game, and we thought, okay, you know, what should we do? And yeah, Mushi Misama was in the arcade, and it's like, well, we'll do this game called Bitter Moth. <laughs> and the idea of the game was bitter moth, yeah. Okay. And you you're this grumpy moth. <laughs> and everything's pretty and butterflies. And what you do is you take you drain the colour out of them. The, right, there's right, the soul draining score mechanic. And we thought, well, we'll just do that as a quick little game. Then when like and James will talk more about like getting the thing up and running, but we quickly discovered that if you make that game what you're left with is a very dull looking game if you're draining the color out of everything <laughs> it kind of ends up looking kind of drab right so it, it changed to space moth and we made everything neon there more, you go and like more, more colorful. yeah um so yeah that that was the sort of concept was bitter moth and because we didn't really have any idea of how long it would would take we kind of just thought oh, it would just be a quick just make a quick little fun game but it ended up taking a bit longer than we thought how long he did it take bring... I, well james used to bring his laptop down to the arcade and like show everyone what we were working on and, and stuff that seemed to go on for a while that's pretty i'll cool. hand that over to you james <laughs> yeah um so this was Shortly after um, I finished a, a uni course in digital animation um, and we used Flash a lot and ridiculously the very, very first version of Space Moth was made in Flash oh, wow. as a Flash game. <laughs> oh, wow. And the main thing we learned about that was um, Flash is not well suited to bullet hell. I could see that. <laughs> But yeah, it, it, the very, very first version was in Flash. Um, I, remem I remember the good old days of Flash. I made a ridiculous cartoon uh, on Flash that I put on Newgrounds, and I have tr and I made it when I was seriously like 10 years old or something like that. I was like a little kid when I made it. And I have tried and tried and tried to find it on Newgrounds, and I cannot find it you know it's it's lost to the ethernet of time but yeah i remember playing around with flash even when i was was a kid and trying to animate it and stuff and the, i i just wanted to dig it up and maybe watch it on the channel just to laugh at how you know rudimentary it was but i i can't find it unfortunately oh well i, I genuinely I like to see it if you ever find it i don't think i ever will i've tried and i think it because i just uploaded it to Newgrounds and then you know, my computer crashed and I threw it away because I was 10 or whatever. <laughs> and I, and I, so I don't think it uh, may, survived the internet. But uh, yeah, I do remember the working. Whole, um... The purpose of that story was I do remember working with Flash a little bit. And yeah, I could see how much of a nightmare that thing would be to try and do a bullet hell in. Yeah, I think the whole um, Flash era of online games is something that people are beginning to have a lot of nostalgia for and to to realize how important it was maybe not for making all-time classics right but for getting people started in game development yes and started in animation um and i think that there's a lot of worth in that well there was a few of them right that went on to be some like went on to be what do you call it like a mainstream type games wasn't there like a Ah, uh, I swear, there's... It wasn't Alien Hominid I think, I think, a Flash game? Yeah, at some point? Alien Hominid. Oh, uh, yeah. I think Super Meat Boy might have been as well. Right, yeah. I think so. I think but I yeah, remember watching a, a documentary cool about that a long time ago. And the only things I really remember from it was that guy would put his face up to his Macintosh and that Super Meat Boy was a Flash game in the beginning. I think those are the two lessons I learned. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the very first version was made in Flash, and Flash, like I said, it, it is not great at doing bullet hell. Um, I'm sure there are some games, uh, some bullet hell games made in it, except it's a, a, a big challenge, and we switched engine to Game Maker. 
Nice. Yeah, which is still extremely popular. Push yeah. maps and very, very well suited to 2D games. I think so. Uh, a lot of great shmups have been made in Game Maker, and I think I really like it. Maybe I'm a little biased, but I really like it. Uh, I'm a bit biased too, since uh, <laughs> I used it all the time. But yeah, I I found it quite easy to use, and we've we've kept on using Game Maker since then. And it has had a lot of updates. You have to give that. Some of the updates in Game Maker Two make me like raise my eyebrows and so i actually will sometimes still pull up game maker one for a few things um and i could be just not because i just started using game maker two so i could be a little bit unfamiliar with all of its features but i remember in game maker one when you'd go to do sprite animations it had these nifty little tools like you could reverse it or you could have it shrink to a size or have it fade to a color and it would like animate that for you and in game maker two i cannot find those features in it I go to look in the uh, image editing, it's, they're not in there. So sometimes I'll actually export my sprite from Game Maker 2, put it into Game Maker 1, do those little animations or whatever, and then put it back inside Game Maker 2. All right. <laughs> so you, um, you swapped ben, over you to, to... Yeah, you swapped over to Game Maker, and then is that when Space Moth really started cooking? Yeah, I think um, by that point, because we'd got a, a fully working, but um, slightly janky, uh, flash version of Space Moth, we knew what we wanted it to be. Did you have to recode and, the entire thing, I'm assuming? or did Yes. You? Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Um, which was a pain, except, uh, yeah, unfortunately, Action Script doesn't really translate to GML, Game Maker Language, at yes. all. Right. So we just rewrote it. But it, I think it was better for that. It was a lot faster. And oh, yeah. cleaner, to be yes. honest. Yes. I think like of the two... Like a nicely structured code. Yeah, Game Maker turned out to be the winner between it and Flash, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think his, history will, will back you up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Flash is you know, sadly no longer with us. But Game Maker is here for the moment. So what were the biggest challenges with, with making Space Moth? Like, I as far as game design? Um, can you remember, James, there was there was a time when, like, obviously James had to, to do a lot of groundwork with the coding just so that we could say, okay, we've got a stage now and we can start putting enemies in it. And I do remember that day, James, where we were just like, right, so what do we do? <laughs> what do we do then? Like, it was like we had a blank stage and it's like well where do you start like what order do you do you start making a shmup yeah like, what's, exactly what's the, what's the most important thing and i think we kind of discovered quite <laughs> quickly that what what you do well i i would sometimes I, not not for, so much for space month i don't remember that maybe it was i would do like a rough because i did the backgrounds which would dictate the kind of theme of the stage and i would do a rough layout and we'd like muck around with that and then james would put that in and tweak it as he was putting it in so at least we had some enemies to shoot and then you think well you know whilst they're not firing attacks you get to sort of see pacing and like you know where is there a bit where there's a gap and, and right, stuff right, like right, that right, so exactly cool. so you do that we kind of did that and then start giving them attacks and then you'd have an idea for an attack and that would mean that it's well that bit's too difficult now so you'd take an enemy you know it was all sort of like that it was like a weird sort of order that we eventually figured out and then you make one stage and it's like well the next stage has got to be harder <laughs> yes know? yes and then you have to rebalance go back and balance and so it was a, it was a it's a tricky one when everything was read it's like right we're set we can now actually start doing the fun bit of making the game it's like oh right <laughs> It, yeah, it was... That's interesting. So you ended up doing all of the sort of enemy layouts first before they had attacks. You just kind of like, okay, some enemies go here and there and here, and then we'll figure out the attacks after we got them laid out. Sometimes, not always, but yeah, yeah. It's like you know, well, if it was a big enemy, it would need an impressive attack. So we kind of knew that that would that'd be a choke point sort of thing. So we right. wouldn't put too many other things around it. I, I to be honest though, James, I can't remember because the way that the bullets were done in the original Space Moth, James, you, 
it, you did them, it was like hand coded every attack or something. You'll have to talk about that, James. Yeah, um, De like Dan said, he did really nice uh, background layouts for all of the stages, and those were the starting point. Um, for example, in stage two, there are um, old trees and logs. Um, which seemed like a natural point to put big enemies that function like turrets on. And so we'd go through the stages and put all of the background enemies on in places that made sense. And yeah. then put other enemies, like little waves of popcorn enemies on top or medium-sized enemies that would fly around. Yeah, I've um, always... And that was the general flow. I've always wondered about how Cave would do this type of thing. Um, especially Cave, because they they really have a lot of integration between what the background looks like and what is actually happening gameplay wise. Like you're saying, like there's sections where they'll have just this bridge, and happens to be on top of that bridge, there's some tanks, but around them is like empty space or whatever, so there can't be tanks on that. So they have flying enemies. Then they put silos out, and like they really do a great job of integrating the background with the enemy. The enemy layout. I, I remember I remember seeing an interview with Aikida and he was saying that I, I, isn't the background artist, I might be getting this wrong, but on a lot of cave games it was kind of done by one guy called Tanaka, I think. He was saying that that like Aikida was saying that, that skill of designing backgrounds for a shmup is an incredibly difficult skill to, yes. to be good at. And I it's like understand that. To, be able to do that it's like you're gonna to have to be really good at that one thing and his those backgrounds are amazing you're right because i mean they must have a way of like shifting them they all look as if they're like complete pieces of art but they obviously must be able to shift individual elements around but if you yeah, if you look at like the roads on say the and stuff like that it, it's all seems part of the level design and, and enemy placement so there must have been a lot of collaboration or maybe he just did some cool looking backgrounds and he knew what he was doing and like, well, they'll want some stuff here. And they worked around the backgrounds. I, I have no idea. Yeah, that's what I've always wondered. Because I know how like the Toho style way of doing it is, which is which was what I might resort to, which is like you create sort of this, uh, it's sort of a background type thing. But it's more like a backdrop, maybe. Is it's a, a movie movie. that plays in the background. Yes, it's, it's like a backdrop that... Yeah. You could do whatever. You could throw whatever you want on top of it. It doesn't need to like logistically make sense that much. Whereas with like a more traditional shmup style, especially verticals, I think, um, like you say, you kind of need to know what you're doing with that background before you place enemies on it, or maybe make it adjustable. Like you said, this is still a mystery to me that I'm trying to actually solve. <laughs> like, how do they come up with these backgrounds exactly? So I'm like a really big fan of like uh, pinball. Uh... Uh, Playfield designs. I, I love a lot of the artwork from the 60s and 70s pinball machines. But if you look at the schematics of those of those things, of what the artist is given, and then it's like, well, you know, we want to come up with a theme, and they <laughs> yeah. have to accommodate where the you know the the thick different elements of a pinball playfield are going to be. It's kind of crazy because they look so complicated. Yes, it's. So they just paint that on afterwards sort of thing. They don't design it, but um, it's a similar kind of thing, I think. Well, I, I don't know how Cave do it, and I don't know how other companies do it. But that's how we did Space Moth. We kind of started off like that. And they could, the backgrounds could be changed and stuff if we had to, but no. That was, that was actually one thing that we were really adamant about, was that a lot of indie games at that time didn't have ground-based enemies, just yes. precisely because of that. Yes. As a you know, but you know, as a player, do you care? Well, like ultimately, it was a lot of work to do that. But I'm wondering how important that was like a really important thing for us. But I'm wondering, looking back, if if it was worth all all that extra work, it probably was now. But yeah, it, at the it's time, one of the, I think it's one of those things where you care, but you don't realize that you care. Yeah, like you don't yeah. know that you care that there's ground based enemies. You don't know that you care that there's bullet ceiling and that type of thing. Until it's gone, then you're like, what is it exactly? Something's missing here. And it's like, well, there's no mm. bullet ceiling. There's no ground-based enemies. Like, that's a that's a, I know, a pretty big criticism of Toho that uh, I think is pretty valid, right? That Toho basically has no ground-based enemies. It's every enemy is a flying enemy in that game. Yeah. Almost all of them. So 
I mean, you could fudge it with like syncing up the, the sort of scrolling speed with an enemy appearing and make it look like it's on the ground with some careful kind of well i'm trying that's funny you bring that up because in the game i'm working on i'm i am trying to fudge it because a lot of this it's kind of this weird thing where i'm not good at drawing or anything like that so i have to use a lot of sprites i have access to and a lot of sprites i have access to are like rpg ground-based sprites and so it's like, okay, let's make these ground-based somehow, but they're in the sky. And so I was like, I'm thinking of like adding little magical tiles that they that appear as they walk. You know, like they're walking on these sky tiles or something. Uh, Do you not just put like fire under them or smoke or <laughs> some kind of weird ripple effect as if they're hovering? Yes, I, that's another one too. I might do a mixture where some of them are walking on sky tiles. Some of them are... The, the character sprite, I put like a flying Nimbus under it. So that that's how the character sprite works. He's on the flying Nimbus type thing. Uh, nice. You could um, d go all Aspergalida and give them flying wings. Yes, that's another too. way yes. of cheating. Yes, that's another way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So Space Moth, um, I remember that coming out quite a while ago. When did it first release? Because it's, it's an older game. I remember that. Like you said, you made it in Flash, so... Yeah, um, I think, uh, just off the top of my head, it was about 2014, late 2014, when right. um, it was original Space Moth, and then the DX update, um, which includes the original Space Moth, and then has the new DX mode, so it's kind of a two-in-one. Yeah. Um, it was 2016. So after you released Space Moth, and it came you know on steam or however you first released it what were the initial lessons that you immediately took away from that release that you're like okay we need to look at these when we do dx mode <laughs> well to be honest uh, one of the initial lessons that i thought was like don't self-publish on steam <laughs> get you know get a publisher <laughs> right yeah, um before uh, before it was on steam um it, it was briefly on the Humble Bundle, or the oh, Humble Store, rather. Yes, right. That was like initially where you could buy it, and then it went on to Steam shortly afterwards. Um, and yeah, just from a a business point of view, the one of the big lessons we learned was that PC gamers really love Steam. Yes. And they love Steam so much that even if they like your game and blood, they probably won't buy it unless it turns up on Steam. I... So we had a lot of interest in the game, um, or at least for a, a very tiny game with uh, low marketing in a niche genre anyway. Um, but until it went on Steam, we didn't really see uh, big sales. And then there was a huge spike once it did get on there. Yeah, I. this is a mystery that I have not been able to solve. It is. It is absolutely... You're absolutely right. Why that is... To this day, I don't understand. For for example, there'll be shmups that you can buy on other platforms on on a PC, like right? so. It's not like they're not on PC. Like they'll be on itch, or they'll be on itch our DL site, or they'll be, you know, some other, you know, humble bundle. Like you're saying, like these smaller non-Steam versions. But like a lot of people will be like, nope. I'm just waiting for the Steam version. Forget that shit. It's like, why? <laughs> what is Steam adding? I don't know. I, I, I really, it's a mystery to me to this day. I, I think it's mainly just adding convenience. Um, yeah. Because people don't want to have a million launches uh, in the same way that um, it, initially Netflix seemed really cool, but now you have to subscribe to like 10 different streaming services in order right. to get all the different parts of right. the series. I think... Um, yeah, it just boils down to convenience for a lot of people. They want all their stuff in one place. And even if it's not uh, quite the most convenient or doesn't have quite the best interface, just because they've been using it for so long and they already have a big library there, they don't want to start splitting things up well, over a, a lot of different launches. Well, I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on this because I have thoughts that uh, some people think I'm being whatever... I don't know, whatever. I'll just say, but I always, my biggest problem with Steam is that they take like, from what I heard, 30% or something. Whereas if you s sell it on itch or whatever, you can sort of slide that down to a much smaller percent or no percent at all. And I do understand that Steam, like you kind of have to put it on Steam because it has, it's just the place where people buy crap. 
So if you're going to find discoverability, but I always, you know, thought that if, if, uh, if you could kind of do a, a thing, like maybe you release it on itch first and then, you know, like, okay, get it on itch people. And then like sort of your fans will get it on itch. And then you're like, okay, now we'll bring it to steam and then steam can take their big fat cut. Uh, I always thought that might be a good strategy, but, but the problem you run into, like you're saying is like people love steam. And so that it's hard to convince people to buy on other platforms. Yeah, it, it is difficult. And, and another thing um, that, that people don't take into account when saying, oh, you should just release it on this store or that store is that often it's not up to the dev because unlike on itch, you, you can't just put stuff on. Yes. You have to get permission from the Whatever. company that has yeah. opens the store. Like um, with Space Moth, we, we did try to get it on good old games. I'm a big fan of. I play a lot of retro FPS games on that. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't feel uh, at the time anyway. Um, we should, we could maybe resubmit it at some point. But at the time, they didn't feel it would be uh, a good fit for their store. I think. I'm um, sorry. Despite I, the fact that my we memory really serves, that, we I think uh, Blue Revolver had that same issue with them. If my memory serves from the last podcast episode or two, like I, I, I don't think they accepted Blue Revolver either. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have uh, a few older Windows and DOS shmups. And I could be wrong. So if I'm wrong, sorry, Dan, but I might be getting confused which game it was. But it was some other shmup that had this problem, too. Yeah, um, so that that's one thing in Steam's favor, I guess. Um, you, you do have to pay for it as, as a dev, but you can self-publish. So if you have a lot of faith in your game and other stores don't, then although it will cost you, you can at least get it onto a store like that. Yeah, and I always thought that, uh, yeah, good old games is cool and everything, but from what I understand, their revenue cut isn't any better than Steam. So I thought as like a, a shmup developer, it didn't seem like that great of a deal anyway, because I, I heard they take a similar revenue cut as Steam. Like they're not, they're not like itch where you can just slide it down to zero and let it rock, you know, type of thing. Um, I'm not sure what uh, what their revenue cuts is, but at, at least on itch, I think that's the most developer friendly store yeah. that I'm aware of. Hell yeah! In, uh, purely in terms of the the cut that they get versus what you get. Yeah. But as you said, the discoverability and just yes. the the unwillingness of people to leave the Steam ecosystem kind of hurts that. Yes, absolutely. That that that's. Mm, yeah, that's where, like, if you could do some kind of, like, straight to customer marketing, like, either on YouTube or Reddit or whatever, it's, yeah, it's a, cha it's a challenge for sure. <laughs> but uh, I want to le learn more about this uh, publisher thing. So you said you brought it out on Steam, and then one of the lessons you learned is that you needed a publisher? Well, it's it's just the getting, there's, there's so many games come out on Steam, and, you know, uh... I think, like if you say sort of selling direct to to your fans, I mean you've got to have a lot of fans in the first place to make <laughs> right. it yes worthwhile, you know. And, and a publisher should public publicize your game and get it get it known, you know, because <laughs> well, basically, you, you, ideally you'd be good at everything but we've been under a rock making a game you know you, yeah you kind of some you need some help with some of the heavy lifting of actually getting it out and noticed which is a whole other thing oh yeah you know it's a completely separate to making a game and 100%. so we we tried it with space moth but then we we were approached by a diff, by a publisher and that's and we sort of redid it of like about a year later with the yeah, as James says the DX mode, and it was on Steam and it, it sold a lot better. You know they they did they did get some sales for it, so it was yeah we were quite lucky because um, I think uh, at the time that our publisher was Black Shell Media. Oh, I haven't heard um, of them. And uh, yeah, they they used to publish a lot of indie games on Steam. I think they. Uh, They've stepped away from that recently, um, but around the time Space Moth came out, they were quite prolific, and they actually got in touch with us instead of the other way around. 
and said, hey, your games look cool. Do you want to work with us and put them on Steam? So that was a, a really big stroke of luck. And that was... So we didn't have to shop around for a publisher and try and convince people that, oh, it's, yeah. it's worth putting a shmup out. Someone yes. got in touch with us. And that was back when... Okay, I might be out of the loop on this stuff, but wasn't that back when like you had a green light and all that sort of stuff? Or yeah. was, was that yeah. the era? Yeah, yeah. that's right. This, that was uh, in, in prime green, green light time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so, someone slightly unchartably but truthfully uh, described Greenlight as like a, a popularity contest for indie devs. Yes. Which uh, it effectively was. You had, um, f for anyone that's tuning in, isn't aware of stream Greenlight because it got shut down a while ago. Um, people could put, put their games on it and say, here's my game. Is why you should buy it. Please vote for it. And then, if it got enough votes, then it would get onto Steam. Yes. Whereas now you can self-publish for a fee, for a set amount of money, you can get your game on Steam. But at that point, it, you had to prove to Valve that there was enough interest to warrant your game being on Steam. Right. But and there I'm was sure a, there, there was, was also all an, kinds of naughty work. Well, there was this other. There was this other weird thing about it. Whereas every month, wasn't it something like it was accumulation over months, and then it would go down the next month, and then you had to get it back up again. It was like a weird <laughs> thing where I remember one time we were at ninety percent or something, and then it went to sixty four percent, and it's like what? I, I never really could get my head around it. But yeah, it was um, well another one of many reasons why it was shut down um, is because it. It was very hard to understand. It was not straightforward at all. Um, and it was open to, unfortunately, open to abuse with um, p people paying uh, for votes and things and saying, oh, we'll give you free keys for our game if you know you and all of your friends in your guild or whatever vote for this title or that title. Um, so I, th I think that the intentions behind it, as with a lot of uh, stuff that Valve has dropped, were very, very good. Um, trying to get games that they knew would sell and which had a fan base um, on Steam and giving developers a chance to promote their games. But ultimately it kind of backfired and yes. now they've just gone with the, um, the self-publishing system saying, well, if, if you think your game is great, give us yay much money and we'll put it on Steam. And then if it doesn't sell, well, we've already got your money, so we don't mind. Yes, that's a, I think that's a better solution. Um... Even though you're you're paying more upfront or whatever, yeah, it's just less exploitable than I think than Steam Greenlight. Well, it's it's it's, a, it's it's better, but it's also just means there's so many so many more games now that come on it, so it's oh, much yeah, more absolutely. difficult. Oh yeah, absolutely. it's 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 good in one sense, but it's um it's harder in another sense as right, well. Right, because now you you're battling against the masses, basically. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting sort of uh, ways to think about that. But before before we get into that, I want to learn a little bit more about. Um, so you got your publisher, you got it onto Steam, the Space Moth DX. Did you add in the extra ship for DX, or was the extra ship in the original? Because I never uh, remember. Because uh, I don't think I cleared the original back in the day. I can't remember, or maybe I forgot. I can't remember. Was the was the Hawk in uh, Space Moth, or is that a DX? exclusive <laughs> James I, can't um, I, I, I actually can't remember off the top of my head I'm I'll, sorry. I'll, I'll tell you one thing Aha. though is I'll tell you one thing that, that Space Moth has like this goes to show how what we've learned from Space Moth to now and how we maybe have changed but Space Moth, Space Moth had, one had no cutscenes there was nothing getting in the way of playing the game but it was also brutal like you had to 1cc it to unlock the hawk hell yeah which is <laughs> i mean if you if you play shmups a lot then you, you know it's not too hard it's but it's for most people i think it's it's a tough ask do you have to one cc the game for a, for the second ship yeah that, that's a that's a good question i think that's <laughs> tough to even now to really have a solid answer on because you do get rewarded for your dedication because i remember when i cleared it and got the hawk i was like Hell yeah, especially because the Hawk is pretty OP. <laughs> so I was like, let's do this. Um, but yeah, yeah, I can also see 
people could literally like you could have like 80 percent of your customer base never play the hawk because they never unlock it that's also kind of like exactly. yeah, what I, the hell? I, yeah. I, I think it's probably a lot higher than 80 percent right <laughs> yeah um yeah they, they should definitely be for when once you've seen the game um but maybe making the only other playable character that reward was not a great design move. <laughs> <laughs> so now in Star Hunter, you can you do still have to unlock characters, except you you don't have to once you see the entire game to get them. Yeah, and I um I remember I actually played the Space Moth DX in the very first Shmup Slam, and I, I had a lot of fun. Um, so I don't know, it's. It's hard to, like you're saying, it's hard to really market these games outside of a very small fan base. Have yeah. you learned any lessons on that front or advice that you could give to other developers in this sort of a pursuit? Well, I, I, I think that the, um, that whole thing of like, you've got to once you see it to unlock the second playable ship and no cut scenes, so it's just a straight forward you're right in into it i mean that appeals to a certain type of arcade gamer who just wants to go for one cc's but you kind of want more more as many people to play your game as possible and characters and stories are are a good way to get people to look at your game who might not normally play it um so i know that when we did star hunter we were like right we want to get this on consoles and we wanted yes. to char have characters in it. You know, we wanted to reach more people than just the hardcore sort of shmup crowd. So you want to make a game that's more approachable and yet still have that sort of core arcade game design in it. So, so yeah, definitely we've kind of flipped on that. It's like characters are important, stories are important. And you know, making the game attractive to players is important, I think. Yeah, definitely having um, elements outside of the core gameplay that people can latch onto um, will give it greater appeal. And if it's done properly, that doesn't have to get in the way of how it plays. Yeah. Um, because I think with, um, at least amongst people that play a bunch of arcade games, they'll they tend to think that if you add a, a emphasis on story and characters, then that will automatically water down the gameplay. And you'll right, have right. a huge, you know, you have to have a huge cutscene at the beginning. You need to have a character bio. You need to have just dead air in the stages as you drift past gorgeous scenery, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't have to be the case at all. Yeah, um, so, so what, you, what are your methods of getting possible. around that issue? Um, well, well, let's see. First, first of all, for cutscenes, th this is incredibly obvious, but make them skippable. Yes, <laughs> the love of God. We've got an option in the in the in the menu to just turn them off entirely, and then that's that sorts out everyone. If you do like the story, you can watch them. If you want to watch the cutscenes sometimes, you can, and then you can press start to get through them. And if you really don't mind, you can just turn them off. Yeah. And I said that that sounds like a really dumb, simple, duh, why don't you do it thing. But so many games of every type. Yes. Not just maps have really Absolutely. long, boring, unskippable cutscenes. Max Payne, what, three? Is it three or four? <laughs> that freaking <laughs> three, game. I think, yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed the gameplay of that game. I played through it once and it forces you to watch the cutscenes. I was like, fine, Max mm. Payne. Fine. The one time. But no, no, no. If you play through it again, it still forces you to go through. Like you can skip some of the cutscenes, but other ones, it's like, nah, you still have to watch this. And so I was it's... like, screw this game. Like, and so I don't play it anymore, strictly because of that. I sometimes think that I would actually rather look at a blank screen saying loading than what having to rewatch the yes. cutscene. Yes. Because it's yeah. not intrusive. It's like that can just be going on whilst the game's doing its thing. But if I have to, it's like I have to mute the damn thing or just look away. <laughs> I know yeah. that, uh, Shadows of the Damned does that because I really like Shadows of the Damned. And that you have to watch everything. You can't skip anything in that game. It's a bit of a weird game, but 
Yeah, and what's kind of funny is like Metal Gear gets a, a really bad rap for this because of well, the codec calls you can fast forward through, which isn't perfect. But um, a lot of those cutscenes you can skip in Metal Gear. So even in Metal Gear, that's really notorious for having lots of cutscenes. You can skip through those. Whereas, well, for example, a lot of modern games now, they don't really they they think they're real clever. They're like you know cutscenes that's so two thousands. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it integrated in the gameplay with these nice uh, little yeah. walking sections. And Force so, oh, yes. oh my the, god, the this good is triple A walkie talkie section. Oh I my god, well and I hate them. Yeah, I know. This was the death nail for me for playing modern games. Like this is really what broke me from playing a lot of them. Because I'll I'll be like, all right, I'm not a I'm not trying to be a big hipster here. I'll, I'll play the game everyone's talking about. I'll, I'll give it a try. Like Last of Us, not two, one. Last of Us One, where everyone said this is the greatest game on earth. It changed my life. I, you know, learned to live again playing this game. I was like, all right, <laughs> this this is a big game for everyone. I'll go ahead and play it. I could not get through about three hours of that game because half the game you're just walking and talking. I'm like, what the hell? I can't do this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So even The Last of Us One, which if you look on like I you know, all the review sites is like the greatest game of all time or whatever. Even that one, I was like, I cannot handle this. So, yeah, that was kind of the breaking point for me. Yeah, um, I I think, like you said, those walkie talkie sections are a, a badly implemented way to try and get around cutscenes. Right. Um, but you can have storytelling in inside the game um, and working well. I'd say something like uh, Metroid, especially Metroid Prime, does that just through environmental storytelling. Yeah, very true. And things like um, the little scannable entries. Yeah. But you can see optionally find out more about um, the the lore and things that happened before you arrived on the various planets you visit. Um, very true. I think that's a, a much better way of doing it. Um, because, it, again, if you do care about stuff you've got that optional thing that you can go for reading the logs and if you don't it's perfectly playable without doing any of them and either way you'll be getting some amount of story just through the way the environment is constructed yeah i'm a huge fan of that with with shmups as well for instance uh radiant silver gun actually kind of figured this out and i didn't realize it because it has two different modes it has the arcade mode then it has the saturn mode I think that might be the one of the silver bullets to this sort of conundrum where you get you make two you make like a, a mode that's the story mode that has all this extra stuff it has the cutscenes it has all that stuff for like casual people to get into but you flip a switch into arcade mode it trims down a lot of that stuff it, and then it becomes an arcade game I, yeah. I really like that approach I really wish they did that with Streets of Rage 4 that just came out because the problem with Streets of Rage 4, I do like Streets of Rage 4 quite a bit, but the problem with it, I think, no matter how much of a fan you game are of that game, when you go to do, like, Mania plus no death runs and stuff, and the game is two hours long, and some of the stages are like, this stage could just go. This could just be, like, we could trim this down. I think that would be fantastic if they, because I think the story mode, like you're saying, is really good for the casual people to get into it, and they feel like they got their stomachs full for their money but for the people who want to play it in the more arcade sense have that if you could flip over to arcade mode and it like cuts out half the stages and like focuses in the gameplay kind of like we were saying with thunder force 3 and 4 right something like that, that i think that also yeah. would be a good compromise yeah i like streets of rage 4 but um but it's it is very long <laughs> uh, even for beat em up which yeah which, which tend to be quite quite long, at least for arcade games. And yeah, if there was an arcade port, they'd have to severely trim it down. Um, but it can it can kind of get away with it because um, it's a console game. So you don't have a queue of people waiting for the cab behind you. Yeah. And the, th the thing about it is I run into this like as a reality because I'm a huge fan of the game and I go to stream it, right? And I'm streaming it. I'm like trying to get Mania Plus or Mania No Death or Mania Clears and everything like that, which I have gotten. But it's it's sometimes pretty brutal because a lot of the difficulty lies at the end, right? So you play for about an hour and 45 minutes really well, and then you get to the last stage and you die three times in, you know, three minutes, and then you game over and you're like, all right, so now I need to 
play another two hours to try again. That's where <laughs> I think it starts to break down. It, I think there is sort of like a, a, a literal time limit to how how much an arcade game can can go without it being a, yeah, too obnoxious. Yeah, I think if, if you look at most um, re recent, when I say recent, like in, in the last 10 to 15 years, um, arcade shmups or arcade games in general, it seems like everyone's decided that between 20 to 30 minutes is the sweet spot. They're almost always about 25. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Now, when you and get for, the two loopers me, that's going, right. yeah, and we get the two loops going, um, that's that's an interesting question too because there is sort of a fun element to the double loop system where it's like this huge quest to get one. But even Cave themselves kind of stepped away from that later on with, with like they did the mode select instead where, okay, instead of playing normal loop one and then a, a hard loop two, they decide, okay, you just select it at the select screen. They even did that in SDOJ, right? That's the, I think the only Cave game, or sorry, Dodon Pachi game that gets away from the double loop system. The, the, the double loop system is a weird thing to do, I think for arcades yes. because it's basically means you can be on the machine for like 40 minutes maybe 45 minutes yes, yes. No, no arcade operator wants that so yes. yeah put it in a, put it in a menu at the start <laughs> and then you'll be kicked off even quicker you know if you're not used to it that, that makes more sense from a an arcade game sort of perspective yeah um that's yeah, and from um, a player perspective um for me i'm not a huge fan of double loop games um at least uh in, in an arcade setting because practicing the second loop is a yes. real pain. Oh, yeah. You, you have to, you know, sometimes there might be a, a special condition just to enter it. Yep. And every single time you want to practice the very first stage of the second loop, you've got to spend about half an hour doing <laughs> yes. this perfect run of the first bit just yes. to get there. Yes, exactly. Um, which which is, for safe in a way, kind of cool because there's, there's real prestige for people that can get far into the second loop yeah um but e even for them i think they they would secretly wish <laughs> that that was an easier way of practicing. yes absolutely but that's why it's so amazing like for when you know like for years there wasn't like a ketsui port and you could have people who could two loop it and stuff it's yeah. kind of crazy that that, that was i know a thing i couldn't believe they did it with dodon pachi back in the day so quickly mm -hmm. like how did they do that i i've kind of learned i believe what they did was all the super players sort of got together and they sort of just hung out <laughs> and they're like gave yeah, each other maybe. advice and they're like hey, the this arcade, is how you, yeah yeah this is how you do it and they'd watch each other play the second loop and like take notes like oh okay well, this part here like a little council of super players that stand around the cabinet and figure it out i think that's how they did it that was one of the great things about like the uh the shmup meets that we used to go to at the casino arcade was that I remember when I first went down there because it was around the time that Death Smiles came out on the 360 and they had the Mega Black Label board down there, um, which was really rare, I think. I, I think yeah. There's only a really low number of boards and they had one in it. And I remember playing it and like looking in, like seeing reflected in the glass, like about 10 people all standing around watch, <laughs> yeah, watching. It's exactly. Like, oh, man. <laughs> it's like you've got like an audience. So it's like, you know, that's what arcades are about. And watching other people play and pick stuff up. So I think you're probably right. Like a load of super players just hanging around with each other and helping each other out in Japan. So as far as game design, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on this because you went from the classic vertical of Space Moth to with Space Hunt, uh, Star Hunter, you went with the horizontal aspect ratio, or sorry, um, orientation. Uh, what what was the motivation behind that going from vertical to horizontal and what were the big differences now that you've done both as a game designer um well we wanted it to well we wanted to make a console we wanted to make an arcade game but we wanted to get on consoles and we thought and i, I think a lot some reviews you know vertical games they get sort of criticism for like having loads of dead space on the screen you're not <laughs> using the screen yeah and um, I'm not personally not really a fan of vertizontals. Oh, so, me uh, neither. Some of them work, so, though. Radiant Silvergun kind they, of yeah, changed no, my can. mind a little bit. Like Radiant yeah, Silvergun. Yeah, they can. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so we just decided to do 
ho uh, horizontal game. Um, and it did change because we sort of discovered that, you know, designing bullet patterns for a horizontal game, you, you kind of can't do the same thing as vertical right. games. Yes, exactly. But they've still got to look really impressive and they've got to look interesting and they've got to be, they've got to be dodgeable, like, close up like when you're on the right hand side of the screen but also far left you kind of don't want to make a game where everyone is just pressed right back to the left hand side of the yes. screen so and in 16 by 9 as well that's like another thing yeah so I, I remember th thinking that well we'll just make a four by three game and then chop the top and bottom off but it doesn't work like that um because if you play i think a kai katana uh, that has a four by three mode then it also has the two other 16 by 9 modes and that you can kind of it is easier in 16 by 9 because the bullets are more just more spread out by the yeah. time they get to the far left i think this so, is a, a a brand new territory of shmup design honestly that i don't think has been fully dialed in um even even releases like rolling gunner which i think are fantastic mm -hmm. i still think there's lessons to be sort of figured out with this 16 by 9 ratio it's difficult and i think also that like we we didn't want to do this too much but um i think about it. well sometimes i was thinking well you know if we make grids you know where there's safe spots that's not a bad thing in a hurry you know you just you know so maybe you don't have quite as many aimed shots and you're sort of making crisscross grids where there will be places that you can hold out that's not the end of the world that you probably wouldn't do so much in a vertical game um, so yeah, it was diff it was different and sort of difficult to adapt. Do you think commercially, like you're saying, that uh, you think horizontals are stronger commercially? I could see that. I could honestly see that, especially when I talk to people who aren't really necessarily shmup players. They do seem to uh, prefer horizontals to verticals. Yeah, I think just in terms of um, screen real estate, if, even with the um, the M2 ports mm -hmm. recently where they've got all of the gadgets around the sides of the screen to uh, just fill, fill more of the screen to be honest Yes. Um, pe uh, people that aren't perhaps super into shmups will look at that and then say well a roughly a third of my, my big TV is being used yeah they're like WTF um, and the rest is just um, I, either some artwork or all of these little gadgets but the actual bit where I'm playing um, is, is very narrow. Yeah, I think and this is... I don't think it's a good use of the display. Whereas if it was in widescreen, then I feel like uh, it's it's a better use of my TV. Yeah, I think this is a, a challenge that is going to present itself to the world of vertical shmups because the way the industry or whatever you call it is going is wider. Let's go wide. Let's make it wide. So Darius is happy. Like Darius is like, hell yeah. Okay. We got this. Yeah. But the rest of the, the shmup playing world, especially vertical shmups are like, okay, it's just getting wider and wider and wider. And we're, and like you're saying, we're just taking up a smaller sliver of your screen <laughs> because before, like uh, in the CRT days, I remember this, the size of your screen was like, it got, bigger it just got bigger and bigger and bigger but it's still four by three i remember when my parents got this massive massive crt but it was still four by three and so it still worked and everything like that but the way it's going now my friend has this ultra wide monitor now where it's not really we okay so i have like a regular size monitor he has this ultra wide it's really not that much taller than my monitor but it's just massively wide right and so I went to play a shmup on it, and it's almost hilarious. Like you're saying, it's like this little slice <laughs> on this ultra. And then you can't tate it either, because if you go to rotate the thing, it's way too <laughs> wide to rotate. So uh, this is a challenge, I think, that uh, vertical shmups are unfortunately going to have to figure out. What the hell do we do with this? Well, the Switch is a good... Uh, it's a, that's why the Switch is a good fit, isn't it? Yes. So you can... It's perfect for that. Both Hori and, and Verticals uh, fit really well on the Switch. Yeah, and another thing about the Switch that's really interesting is, like you're saying, uh, playing... Like, for me, when a shmup comes out on the Switch that's horizontal, like, so 
Death Smiles hopefully is coming out on that thing soon. Um, Rolling Gunner and uh, Space uh, Star Hunter. Sorry, I keep getting <laughs> I keep wanting to say Space Moth. Um, these all I think naturally lend themselves very well to the Switch because the Switch. Uh, you just have more screen real estate, you know, when they're horizontals, mm -hmm. rather than I'm trying to play Esperate on my Switch, and it's like I put my face, like the screen to my face, like this, you know, to see the bullets. Uh, so, yeah, I, what, I, I could what, see. You, hang on, what you, you can't rotate the screen? You must be able to in handheld mode. That's what I was talking about. You know, oh, like, well, you can... yeah. Well, the issue is, and this this is an issue that I've heard other shmup players have is. What's cool about the Switch is that you can rotate. I'm holding my phone for the for the audience. Is you can rotate it right with a flip grip, which I do own. But the problem that the flip grip never quite solved is the Joy Cons because the default Joy Cons, in my opinion, are just garbage for playing shmups. And so I play with what's called the the. There's like a special Hori Joy Con, the Hori D pad or something like that. It doesn't have a nice name. It's just a blue Joy Con made by Hori that has a real D pad on it. And then I use another Hori thing on the other side, but those don't work on the flip grip. And so I, it's like a, it's like an ugly little uh, situation where you either go and flip it vertically, but then you got to play with the crappy joy cons or you keep it horizontal, but you have a smaller screen, but you got to play with the nicer controls. So mm. figure that out, Nintendo <laughs> or Hori. Someone's got to <laughs> figure that out. Please give us a proper D pad on the switch too. Yes. Or Hori needs to make Bluetooth versions of those controllers. Either way will work. Just one, something needs to give there. So, uh, speaking again of uh, Star uh, Star Hunter and uh, the lessons learned. So, what were I was playing it, you know, to uh, prepare for today's interview and everything, and I thought it was really interesting the kind of elements of the game because I can definitely see the Escaluda influence, right, with the slowdown mechanics and everything. And then there's other parts of the game that I was playing. I was like, I know this is from somewhere, but I can't figure out where. Like the bomb <laughs> system kind of reminds me of the same bomb system as uh, Devil Engine sort of bomb system. But I know it's not necessarily the same thing. So I would like to learn a little bit more about what the influences were for Star Hunter as far as uh, the systems of the game. Yeah, um, th this might be a good point to talk about the the very earliest version of Star Hunter, actually, which I don't think we've announced online before, because it didn't start off as um, a bullet hell game at all. Really? Yeah, the very first version of it, just after we'd finished working on Space Moth and we were wondering what to do, the, the earliest concept was actually called Project Defender, and it was a Defender slash Resogun style game. Oh, okay. Where you had looping stages that you could freely fly around, you could reverse the ship. Um, and enemies came out of spawners. Oh, okay. And the aim was I get to, it, I get it. Yeah, to co collect enough points or destroy enough enemies to get to the, the next area. Um, even at that point, it did have the Escaluda style slowdown and gold collection. But in terms of how it played, it was completely different. There was no forced scrolling. Um, and yet the, the stages looped. So you could keep on flying around them with enemies chasing you. Right. Yeah. I think there's a game that came out recently that was kind of like that on uh, on Steam and everything. Uh, what was it? I, I remember, I remember the, the one of the things that, like... Um, one of the things about it that we discovered, though, was that, like, uh, we could do more impressive bullet patterns. I think even back when Project Defender started, but we found that what you would do is, if enemies fired like cool bullet patterns at you, you would just reverse away from them <laughs> right, and fly and away. You, could, you just fly away, <laughs> and it's like, well, do we? what sort of game do we want to play? And, and I, I sort of go back and forth on this because I'd love to have seen how it would have turned out and maybe we'll we'll do it in the future. But yeah, we, we kind of, because you could just reverse away from bullets. And then it was also, well, if you fly, if you fly enough to get them off screen, when you turn around and go back, are they still there? Like, do they disappear? So it was like this really weird yes. 
you can see why you can see why defender works because there's it's not a bullet hell game like there's three bullets in defender and one of them's gonna somehow zoom in and kill you uh, but with a with game with a with enemies that fired cool bullet patterns the very nature of the game meant you didn't really have to dodge them or you could just go backwards it was weird it was cool though yeah it was an interesting design hybrid but you you could indeed just reverse away from bullets uh which kind of defeated the point of having really cool patterns yeah so we took the the look of project defender um and the basic scoring system but then reworked that into a more traditional horizontal schmup you know the game that which it became star hunter I don't think I would be surprised if this was a direct influence because I think the game is pretty recent and I'm assuming the development sort of overlapped. But the game reminds me actually quite a bit of Rolling Gunner. And I don't know if that was an influence on you guys at all. But when I'm playing it, I'm like, I'm I'm feeling shades of Rolling Gunner here. Uh, was that an influence at all? Or maybe like Battle Traverse, something like that? Or did you kind of come at this from a, a different angle than I'm expecting? I also do, um, there's one part that I swear you must be referencing Pro Gear. The part where you have the submarines and the submarines shoot the bullets. I'm like, oh, that is so Pro Gear. Uh, was Pro Gear an influence at all? Lots of cave things were an influence. Yeah. Yeah. Pro Gear, just everything cave. Um, Rolling Gunner was not though. Yeah, because I, I, I assume they kind of overlapped in development. Yeah, yeah I think... Um, in, in a lot of ways, they are similar. Um, Rod Rod and Gunner, I think the devs of that must be big fans of Death Smiles, because in my mind, it's it's Death Smiles 3, awesome spaceship edition. <laughs> with with a free free shot, uh, which is really interesting to uh, try and work with. We were, that yeah, game was a very brutal. cool game. Um, that game I, was I only so got it very hard. Recently. <laughs> Yeah, I bought it recently on on Switch and was pleasantly surprised by it. It's really fun, um, but I had I didn't play it until after the development on Star Hunter was finished. So it it wouldn't really factor into how Star Hunter plays. But there are certainly lots of shared ideas between them, and except I think that's just because we both took a lot of influence from Cave. Yeah, I could I, yeah I could see that because I'm more talking about what reminds me of it is. Okay, they're both 16 by 9, which is kind of a new territory. And they both have uh, these dense bullet patterns that you have to just... You just got to squeeze that ship through, you know, so tightly that it's really fun. I, I enjoy that a lot. But I just... I was like, oh, this kind of reminds me of Rolling Gunner. So if you're a Rolling Gunner fan, you'll probably enjoy Star Hunter, is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, with the... I don't... I don't... To be honest, I've played a fair bit of Pro Gear, but I don't remember us really thinking of that consciously. It's more of a... There's a stage in a Kai Katana, which is underwater, and then you come out halfway through. So, that yeah, was... um, for me, a Kai Katana was the... Or the, um, the console mode, no, the widescreen mode, was what yeah. convinced me that a really wide screen bullet hell shooter specifically could work, because, of course, Darius has been ultra widescreen for decades yes but that's much more of a traditional hurry right exactly that even on buses the bullet patterns aren't that dense and you have shields and things to protect yourself yeah and i think akai katana is a very underrated game like yeah it's amazing. very very underrated game something i want to discover or explore more on the channel and i have played it i'd love i'd, I'd love to play the, the the exclusive mode was it there was a red and white mode that was like limited to like 100 pcbs or something yes i've heard about that oh yeah the home pcb version that, that was amazing that version of it i'd love to play that did it ever get dumped no uh, not to my knowledge one of, one of those cave I think um, someone described, I think James, you were telling me that didn't someone describe like Star Hunter as always ESP Katana or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, well, that's fair enough because it does take that sort of slow down mechanic from ESP. Yeah, I if, if I had to pick the two main cave games, uh, because 
obviously we we love all of Cave, but the two biggest influences were Escaluda and Akai Katana. So yeah, ESP Katana yes. uh, oh, isn't actually a bad comparison. And I remember as I was playing Star Hunter for the first time, um, I have I always like to kind of before game before I engage with the game's like in depth mechanics, I always like to kind of just test it to see okay. What if I just refuse to use any of your mechanics? With how's this gonna feel? And I remember mm. just getting absolutely walloped in about two stages. Like, all right, okay, I guess I have to press the slowdown button. <laughs> There's no getting around it. So well, I, I think well, you did a great job with uh, the the slowdown system in the game. It, it feels really good. Well, it's interesting. So, like, one of the things, well, part of the thing we did a lot of work on in bringing it to a console was we put in a load of trophies and achievements. And in uh, homage to Akai Katana, Akai Katana has a, a great trophy called Sh uh, Sheer Grit, and it's clear the game without going into phantom mode. Right. And so we, we put an achievement in Star Hunter and the new Space Moth for, to clear the game without going into bullet time. Because you can just play it and completely ignore the scoring if you oh, kind yeah. of know what's what to do it's you got the kind the, of the power the skill the jammer skill yeah you've got the yeah in you know <laughs> that's something that we were really con conscious of we wanted to make like a scoring system that was really fun and something that you would kind of want to do anyway you know like that player feedback of getting massive gold cancels we we spent a lot ages sort of tweaking that but we also wanted it wanted it to work without the scoring system so you could just stick it on and blow things up because you know it was quite late you know i didn't really like i think james you mentioned earlier like scoring systems in shmups was not a thing to me until quite late i used to play dead on patchy and just blast through everything yeah take any notice of some little bar in the top left hand corner <laughs> it's like, yeah. i don't know what that means um so yeah was... i think um a, a good foundation for any kind of action game but especially shmups is just the the game feel Absolutely. And is the the absolute basics, the moving around and blowing stuff up, does it make you feel powerful? Is it fun? Is it flashy? Does it have a juice? Yeah, this is this is an interesting concept that I actually want to uh, go over with you guys, uh, being developers. So I've always said that my, like what I would like to see in shmups is step one, like you're saying, you need to create a shmup that's compelling purely on survival. Yeah, because and then step two is you need to integrate a really good scoring system into that as well. And once you get those sort of married together, that's where you get a really great shmup, because I have heard of people where, well, they'll make shmup and they they have the scoring system in mind really early. And then they sort of make the shmup with the scoring system in mind to where if you're playing it without playing for score, it's really not that compelling of a game. And so you have to play it for score to, for it to be compelling. But I've always felt like the the best marriage is when you get a game like Donanpachi, for example, where you could play Donanpachi, never think about the scoring system once in your life, and still really enjoy that game and think it's an excellent shmup. But then you add in the scoring, and it's a, a game changer, right? Then you're playing that game for decades. But I think yeah. just having that, having both elements really solid, I think is pretty important. Yes, so, yeah, I mean, for, for sure, like, that's definitely, I mean, even though you may have play, got destroyed on the first two stages when you first played it, trust us, you can just play it without using any of the scoring or the or the slowdown. Um, it's, it's, we, that was like a thing that was always in the back of our mind that it has to be fun just to blast things and dodge yes. a few bullets. Yes, know? definitely is. Um, I, I was, think, you know, that's, another, just, that's uh... another thing that, um, like, sometimes, like, we, we, we discovered this quite early on that it's quite easy to come up with complex scoring systems. <laughs> it's very easy to just come up with weird little things that you have to do and can hide from the player and weird conditions. Yeah. But coming up with a, a simple but good one is is kind of difficult. And uh, yeah, that's something that we really wanted to do with Star was to kind of communicate quite easily what what you do to score but then the fun comes from like you know where you do it and how you actually do it and not putting loads of weird uh, little things but you know but on the other hand people love that you can still find secrets in certain shmups now you know so i don't know yeah that's a tough balancing act to hit yeah 
Another thing I wanted to ask you about is the difficulty select. Because this game's got uh, three different difficulty modes. How do you approach developing that exactly? Because I've never really uh, known how people do this. Do they? Do you start with the normal mode and then sort of go under that and then over that for the other difficulties? Do you start with the hardest difficulty and then just pare down as you go? I've always wondered how does that exactly work for certain people. Um, in terms of what the game is doing behind the scenes, um, it's not three uh, separate sets of bullet patterns for the enemies. It's a, um, a, a set one for the medium difficulty. And then, like you said, that is stepped down or up. Right. If you choose easy or hard. And that's done via an algorithm. So you can make, we can make attacks for the normal mode. And then the game itself will adjust, um, for example, the cooldown time on them to make them more or less dense and right. other things right. for the other difficulties. And then we don't have to make three separate sets of things. We right. can just make the main mode and then the engine itself will transform the attack into a harder version or an easier version. So you, you're still getting roughly the same experience, no matter which one you choose. Yeah, and so are you doing that right up front, or do you just, probably if you're like really uh, looking ahead, you probably do, right? Like you're like, okay, I'm making this bullet pattern. I'll put in these parameters that will make it act differently in the different modes. Or do you do the entire normal mode, and then you're like, okay, I gotta go back through now and add in the other modes. I'm just curious how, how that works exactly. I, I I think that you sort of design some bullet pans, right? And uh, in because James wrote a sort of separate program for for making bullet pans. Oh, and cool. that meant that, and that meant I could actually make some because I can't. I can barely turn on a PC. So that was kind of oh, cool. that's so James, cool. So you had yeah, a whole for, separate um, engine for, for the bullet Space pans. Month. Yeah, for Space Moth, all of the patterns I I wrote out manually, um, which was good in that we had complete control over them, but it took a very long time to modify them if they weren't right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know how um, that is. Yeah, and then if um, we wanted to change something, it just took ages. So for me, one of the things uh, on the development side that I wanted to improve for Star Hunter was we, we knew we wanted to make bullet hell style games and the star of the show is obviously the bullet patterns. Um, but there are no there aren't really many tools for making those. Yes. It's not like you know a 3D modeling program where you have a huge amount of selection or audio. Or again that there are all sorts of programs. It's a very specialist thing. Um, I looked into ways that people had done this for other for other engines. Um, and for other games. And in the end, I thought the best thing to do would just be to make our own editor. Um, that is cool. So we made one called Danmaku Designer. And you can drag and drop uh, bullet emitters onto a grid or onto an enemy sprite. And then they'll just be spitting out a, a, a generic bullet. And then, for example, you can change that sprite to be anything you like. You can move the emitter around. Um, wow. put it in a different place on the enemy and then you can start tweaking things like how fast does it go does it arc through the air does it have gravity on it and that allowed us to extremely quickly make interesting bullet patterns holy crap I didn't know that it was really cool because we would both sort of in, in our spare for fun just make bullet patterns and then see what we've got and think well, well this enemy could do this one and and tweak that and then you would like you design them based on the middle difficulty but then it was sometimes interesting to see what would happen when it was in the bullet hell difficulty or the space get see if it would still work yeah you no know, because you, you don't always know i mean if there's a if there's a certain sum you can do when you're in the, the bullet pattern designer itself where you can enter in a number to see what it'll exactly look like um but we just i just used to design them up with cool looking patterns and then see what it looks like in the game and then alter it from there 
It was all based around the me the middle difficulty. Yeah, that was the main. That's what we designed. The medium difficulty was Luna, the default character, and uh, found that was the best way to work. And then the other characters were balanced all around that. Right. And the other difficult. Well, that's cool. That's cool. He made your own bullet uh, design program. So uh, you'd ha you'd have to figure out some way to import that into Game Maker. I'm assuming. Or no, I don't know. Um. Yeah, that's right. It has its own file format, which is .dan. Um, yeah. <laughs> so if you look inside the uh, the Star Hunter game folders, you'll see a, a file which is just filled with loads of dans. <laughs> <laughs> and they, those are the attacks. And yeah, they, they can be loaded by um, not game maker directly, but an object within the game. Right. Which can take all of the parameters for those attacks and then apply them to an enemy. Holy smokes. That's really cool. So that's, that's it's great. Really... It's it's really great fun to play around with because you, you put James put stuff like in like uh, was it zigzags and you've got bursts and loads of weird things that you can just play around with and so get that's weird where effects. the that's where the bouncing bullet patterns from stage yes, five from yeah because I was yeah, like right, but... I was playing it I'm like <laughs> what the hell is this I've never seen bullets bounce like this yeah yeah that's just um, a tick box you can turn on in Dan Maku Design you can say does this bounce. <laughs> Well, we want this bus to be extra horrible, so yes, yes, it does bounce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm really looking forward for people experiencing the bouncing bullets in Stage 5, because that totally caught me off guard. Uh, they'll learn to love them. It's an acquired taste. <laughs> so, um, that's really cool. And so I'm assuming that means when you make future games, uh, yeah, that'll speed up the process for you, because you don't have to sit and manually code out all the bullet patterns and stuff. That, that's the hope, yeah. Yeah, that's well, yeah, really but cool. it, but but it's 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 such a great sort of tool to have that you can kind of end up just wasting days and days <laughs> like making hundreds of bullet patterns and it's like you just think your eyes and you're seeing loads of kaleidoscopic. Right. You kind of spoilt for choice actually. So it's it's great obviously and it should speed things up, but you got to be careful to limit yourself just to do. You know, I'll do like four or five attacks for one enemy and it's like well <laughs> i just we can't just try all five out because then it defeats the purpose of the actual thing because you'll just be forever right. you, you've got to edit yourself i think that's funny so i want to talk before we end this about space moth uh lunar edition because i'm pretty excited about this and i got to i got to try it out a little bit and i was uh pleasantly surprised that it's not just uh an update like you're like changing the stages they're changing the bullet patterns you're adding a different scoring mechanics i'm like whoa okay this is like a, a i don't know what you'd say an arrange a sequel what is it exactly it's it's borderline sequel territory i think um i i describe it as like an extensive range mode yeah it's it's certainly not just um a minor update like you said they're completely new bullet patterns, which um, were done with Dan Maku Designer again. There's a new, new stuff in the scoring system. There are brand new enemies. The stage layouts have completely changed. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, the, it's the not backgrounds quite a sequel, are different. But... The backgrounds are different? They're darker? Yeah, night, that's night right. It, it, most of the game takes place at night now, and the first stage, instead of um, being in the middle of the day, is at dusk, and you'll see the sunset as you go through that. And it seemed like it was a uptick in difficulty, at least to me. But again, I just hadn't played it as much as the original DX. So, would you say that's accurate? That it's more difficult than the original Space Moth? Mm, I, I wouldn't. It's, it's, it's got a scoring system in it that's quite giving. Like you have a circle that grows around mm -hmm. your ship, and when you activate it, it cancels bullets into skulls and that raises a multiplier so if you think about that you're kind of invincible to bullets for a good portion of the game depending on how often you use it but there is that yeah. it does it does have way more bullets on screen because it, as james says it uses the new and maku designer bullet pattern generator we've got 
I actually think it's kind of a bit easier, to be honest, <laughs> in a weird way. I think to, to begin with, it, um, it will seem harder just because there's so much more going on. Right. Um, because the, the attacks are very dense and elaborate now and often quite quick. Um, but once you get used to using the new scoring system right, um, and how to cancel bullets at the best time, um, then it will probably end up being a little easier. Well, I'm excited because you said there's that achievement where if you don't ever activate the uh, the, the bullet cancel mode, you get some kind of achievement, achievement, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited yeah. for that. Yeah, well, one we, will we, definitely we... be harder than the base game, for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we... That's going to be really tricky. And we originally, like, the, the whole reason that we, we did it was because uh, when we got the publisher for Star Hunter, they, they were talking about doing a, a, phys a physical edition. And a physical edition of uh, uh, one new shmup, and they thought would be more attractive if we had two. So we actually that was the opportunity to sort of update Space Moth and rework it a bit. Um, ah, and that's how we came to do it. Really, and we originally were just going to port it over, but we thought, well, and James was like, well, theoretically, if I port it over to the Star Hunter sort of engine, we can use Dan Maku Designer in it and. You do bullet patterns easily, so it ended up being quite a quite an upgrade, as you said. It was originally just going to be ported over, and maybe we'd fix a few things about it. But yeah, it's 1.5, isn't it, or something? It's in a range. You're right. Yeah. It's in a range mode. Yeah, I think yeah. If, if it was a cave game, it would be Space Moth 1.5, definitely. Me yes, mega, black mega label. red label. Black mega label. Black label. <laughs> yes. Well, I have I've had a lot of fun playing it. I'm I'm looking forward to the final version of it cool i can't remember is there a release date for it yet or not i can't remember i lose track of these things no um, we don't have a a firm release yet but we're in the final stages of doing the the console ports of it so hopefully it won't be too long so before we get to the q a question speaking of console ports i wanted to get the insider baseball and what that process was like uh you know bringing star hunter to the consoles and everything as far as was that a massive undertaking was that a pain in the ass like how did that go for you exactly because i'm trying to convince more people to bring their shmups to consoles because i i think it if at all else will help you gain more exposure for these games and there are a lot of shmup fans i've learned that don't really play on pc which uh, I, I, to some people like myself it's like why why not but they exist so um I, I think console ports are a smart option, but I've heard it can be a real difficult process, so I, I would love to hear what that was like. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a challenging process. Um, the first thing we had to do was make sure that we had achievements. Right, um, right, because right. originally both games had none, and they're optional on Steam. Uh, on Switch, of, of course, that doesn't have a built-in trophy or achievement style system. So that's not an issue. But if you want to release on PlayStation, which I th think is about equal with Switch in terms of how many people play shmups on it, it's very popular. Mm -hmm. And Xbox, which is less popular but still has a, a fairly big shmup fan base left over from the 360 days, because of course the Xbox 360 was a shmup beast. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, if you want to release on those systems, then having achievements isn't just a nice thing it's an absolute requirement you, you cannot release a game ah, without them interesting i didn't know that that's kind of fun though right i don't know maybe it sucks for you but i've always felt like uh it's, it's achievements for, are cool. <laughs> for players certainly. yes um, but adding those in quite late in development um was was definitely a big challenge <laughs> um and we didn't want to leave switch players out so in addition to uh, hooking in all of the APIs and things to trigger those on Xbox and PlayStation and Steam. We made our own little version of that, which works just on Switch. Holy You'll get smokes. little um, in-game notifications complete with a little jingle noise and a message that comes up on stream that slides away again on Switch, and it's got its own little menu, which we call Challenges. Oh, that's cool. But it's effectively the Switch version of those achievements because we didn't want it to be that uh, Switch players just missed out on all of that stuff. You know because why? Although, personally, I'm not 
super keen on achievements most of the time. I know a lot of people really love them. Um, yeah, so you want to do it to be in every version. What I like about shmup achievements, I don't care about achievements in any other genre, but the reason why I like them in shmups is because it's really entertaining to see how like small of a minority you can enter into if you like do bigger gameplay challenges. Like I got an art, ah, it's on the thumbnail of the video, but I got like an arcade original clear of Crimson Clover and the you get an achievement for that. And it, then it shows you like what percentage of players have that achievement. It's like 1% or 0.5% or something. I always think that's pretty cool. Like, so yeah. with Space Moth, if when you get the the no um, special move clear, that'll be fun to, to get that achievement because it'll probably be like 1% of players get that or whatever. You'll, you'll definitely be amongst the elite when you get Yeah, that. yes, exactly. <laughs> I think that's cool. I think that's cool. But uh, I can see it. It was quite fun coming up with them. It was fun coming up with them, like deciding on what's cheap what we would do but then of course you have to extensively test them right. i think there's one in oh, star yeah. hunter, which I, I i was testing the one on star on star hunter on the ps4 the other day for don't kill any jellyfish in stage five in stage three <laughs> it's really difficult it's a very it's a very difficult one to do that so yeah. you can be I've... quite devilish in a shmup with the achievements it's Weird, that, that's weird. a good point about um, testing them as well. It's not just yeah. the difficulty of bu building the the framework of the game around a, a system that's constantly running in the background to check if you've got these achievements. It's right. the more you have, obviously, the more you have to test, and the harder they are, the yes. harder they are to test. Yes, I remember. Um, like even something like a, a one CC. Well, you've got to be good enough to consistently clear your game, or else you're going to waste enormous amounts of time just checking that that one thing <laughs> triggers properly. Yes. I remember I've been working on a shmup, and one of the main goals of it is to be brutally difficult. And I made it so difficult that I had to make a kind of built-in checkpoint system for myself, like every 30 seconds. <laughs> I could play through <laughs> and check save the state. patterns. Yes, exactly. I had to make this like pseudo save state system, which I'll probably just leave in the game when it's all done for players, but... Yeah, just to check. And, you know, that that's what's kind of fun about uh, making a shmup is uh, sometimes you don't really anticipate what the after effects are going to be until you go in to actually te test it. And you're like, whoa, okay, this is way harder than I expected. Or, mm -hmm. oh, this is too easy. We need more enemies here. We need more crap here. Yeah, having some kind of uh, test menu is, is definitely a real help. <laughs> yeah. Just for, for everyone involved in my, making the game. Well, awesome. So thanks so much for you two coming on. Before we end, I thought it'd be cool to do a little Q&A with the chat. Uh, if chat has any questions for you before we head out. So let's see if we've seen... I'll pull up chat here, see if there's been any. So chat, start typing. Get to work. There was one about the... Um, which we, we kind of should address. So yeah, we haven't talked about this already, have we? Um, no. The Nintendo... Europe right. doesn't currently have Star Hunter on it because of a, some weird ratings thing. So that should be up again next week, hopefully. Um, don't really know why it was taken down. It was all the scandalous elements of the game, I would assume. They something, something strange happened with the ratings. Um, so oh, that's I see. A... Yeah, so someone says, ask them why they're having problems with ratings on the European yeah. eShop. The yeah. game's disappeared. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we're not sure why the rating went up in one country. Um, we haven't been told the reason, but apparently the age rating was increased considerably, and because Nintendo treat all of Europe as one uh, one block in terms of the shop, because it has to be resubmitted for that country, it has to go through the submission process for everywhere else as well. So until that's done, unfortunately, it won't be on the European eShop, but we're hoping that it will be back next week. That's crazy. Um, and it's quite frustrating because um, Nintendo's process for this is very opaque. We don't know what the reason was, what uh, people objected to. Any uh, um, rising sun the... flags in there? Maybe that was it. <laughs> Got to remove that. No, uh, as far as <laughs> we can see, there's nothing uh, nothing really objectionable in the game. It could even have been was filling in the form, uh, the online form for what the age rating was. 
Um, and I think this happened to Mushihime Soma. Yes, it did. On Switch in Europe recently as well. And once again, because some country objected to something in the game, so it has to be pulled for them. But as I said, but, um, Nintendo treat all of Europe as one block in terms of the shop, so that means it gets pulled from everywhere until that one country is um, d- done with upping the age rating for whatever reason. The anyway, next... we're hoping it will be back next week. The next question is, what are you most proud of with Space Moth and Star Hunter? And what's next? That was from uh, Katrina. Well, Dan, Dan, what are you most proud of? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm glad that we've... we've... On a console. I mean, we could tell, like, there's a long story about how we got a publisher and all that is quite a, a thing, but getting getting the games finished and actually released on consoles is, is like, like a real, that was a real early goal. And also, you know, um, yeah, we kind of wanted to do scoring systems that are sort of fun. Uh, and they're kind of linked to survival as well. We, we don't like scoring systems that are separate to survival. We like them that it's a, it's a thing you can use for survival or score, you know? Yeah. I think I think both games now, the, the new version of Space Moth, I think that works really well with it. Yeah, I'm very pleased with how flexible the game systems are as well. Um, it's great to get them on consoles. Um, and I'm personally very pleased with all of the bullet patterns we came up with. So, any thoughts on what might be next? Hmm. <laughs> James? <laughs> <laughs> um, <A> holiday? <laughs> yes, in, in the short term, just a, a bit of a break from, from Game Dev. Uh, oh. Uh, Speaking of, here's then, a... Yeah. Oh, I was, here's a follow-up question that kind of goes along with that. Uh, Maximiliano, I'm hoping I'm saying that right is asking, can you live off of indie gaming? Like, indie game developing? Good question. That's the million dollar question right there. Well, at, at the moment, we, we've we um, only got the full sales from the physical editions of the game, which did sell very well, but uh, it's not on the shop at the moment, unfortunately, in Europe. And we uh, have yet to release on PlayStation and Xbox, so we, we can't really um, comments on the sales overall at the moment. I certainly hope that we can live off of it. That would be the dream. <laughs> yeah, that, that's um, awesome. But yeah, right, right now you can, um, it hasn't really been released on enough systems. It's not available on enough things for us to tell if that will be possible. But I certainly hope so. And we've tried to make it appeal to as many people as possible. I think I think going going forward, that the one thing that we want to do is uh, we make more games quicker yes and it, it takes us a, a long while in the way that we've been working um it's taken us a long time to make a follow-up to space moth and one thing we want to do is maybe change the way we work a bit try and get a game out a year or something you know and then you can probably you can make an, a, a better living as an indie dev if you're releasing good quality games at least one one a year but if you're doing one every four or five years then probably not yeah that's so. what i was about to say this is something that i've thought about a lot is like the big challenge that i've noticed among indie games whether it's shmups or not is they kind of live or die on one release right it's like you release your indie and if it fails you fail and if it doesn't fail mm. you milk that bad boy for about five or six years and then try and release a (laughs) follow-up that seems to be the model but i was thinking like and i could see why that is like i understand the realities of what that is but i do think it would be cool if um especially shmups because you know i think like you're saying if you get the engine sort of put in place and get like things sort of optimized i'm thinking back to like old Mega Man stuff back in the day where you'd get like a new Mega Man game about every year or so same with cave that drop a new shmup about every year or so like they yeah. they were moving units right and so i think maybe yeah, they're not they're not they're not building those games from like the engine from the ground up each time they've got their engine they've yes. got their framework yeah 
they're putting new ideas, new scoring systems, new assets into it, and they're reworking it. And I think, yeah, that's definitely something. That's where it sort of becomes more of a of a, a real business rather than sort of like something you're doing part time or you know it's like a dream job. It's like where you turn it into a look at the way you work to make more games but keep the quality up. You know. Yes, um, exactly. I think it would be good to. Uh, I mean, because, yeah, because James and I basically kind of do almost everything. So, um, yeah, if you've got two people or one person as an indie dev, it's going to take you ages to make, yes, <laughs> to make exactly. a game, isn't it? Yes. Well, even yeah, Sun um, and Toho is another good example of that. I mean, yeah. he just kept, kept, at least earlier on when he was, you know, sort of in his prime, he was just kept it moving. And you could see, like, incremental improvements as he was going along, right? Like three to four, five to six. That's one thing that's really cool about Toho is you can watch the you can watch the development evolve over time right in front of your face. Whereas a lot of the way I've noticed like indie games work these days is you know they make Jonestown and then okay you made Jonestown like is there a sequel yeah. is there a follow up what what's the thing here and I think you know that would be cool to see more of like a, a studio model with indie games where like. Oh, we know you from Space Moth. Oh, we know you from Star Hunter. So there's a little bit of a shorthand there, even for your audience too. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what the next game will be in terms of how it will play, but certainly um, the behind the scenes stuff for the development, I think we'll need to take a really good hard look at the tools we're using. Um, it was a very, very underrated job in game design and just software design in general is um, the, the people that make the tools for how, how the game works. And you can tell when a studio has really got them down. Um, like uh, Squaresoft before they morphed into Square Enix. Yeah, you can exactly. see that they had a, um, a very well-oiled machine behind the games. Mm -hmm. And then once they've got this, um, this framework in place for making RPGs, then they could start doing strange experimental stuff with it and just focusing on the, the the pure game design instead of the technical challenge of well how do we actually get this on the screen how do we make that work yeah we were doing 3d for the first time how are we going to make these models you don't have to start from scratch every single time mm. basically yeah and i think that that's a big reason why lots of indie games as you said make one or two projects live and live or die on them they're not yes. um making things in an iterative way with the like, well, here's a, a small test for my RPG. Maybe you can run around a town and do something like an item shop simulator or just some fun little battles you can do. And then the next game is that with some more stuff on, and then it evolves again. And then eventually it turns into their big dream project. They'll yeah. think to themselves, oh, I, I can't release anything apart from the, f the final idea I have in my head. So all of these little projects that people would enjoy playing and they might even pay a little bit for and could give you feedback on that would help make the dream version of a game even better. No one gets to see those because they um, keep those behind the scenes and keep working on them until they get to the great big release. But by then they've spent so much time and money and energy on it that if it doesn't do well, it's that's over. kind of it. You, yeah. don't, you don't hear that from them again. Um, and we're kind of guilty of doing that too, to be fair. Um, but hopefully not again. Dan design. <laughs> yeah. We're not, <laughs> hopefully, we're not going to do that again. No, ho hopefully Dan Macker Designer will help us make um, a any kind of bullet hell game uh, or a similar genre. Um, we'll make that aspect quicker. And Game Maker obviously has a lot of built-in tools yeah. which make things fast. Um, yes. But yeah, we'll, we'll need to take a, a good hard look at the the workflow and the process and the tools that we're using to get stuff out quicker, but still to a high degree of quality. So you don't want to be um, making a new system from the ground up every time and constantly reinventing the wheel. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of, uh, even as a YouTuber, I've learned this lesson. Like if you watch my channel's history, like you can see me in real time learning, oh, Mark learned how to edit this this week he learned how to edit that this week or this month or this year he, oh he learned this how to use this tool same thing with shmup slam like after every slam i sort of have this 
period afterward where I sit and think about, okay, what can I improve? What can I optimize for the next one to make it better? So I think that that mm-hmm. aspect of game design is a little bit underexplored these days because everyone wants to create the ultimate masterpiece and then release it and then you know that's that <laughs> yeah that's the thing about making like an arcade style games like from the outside it kind of looks like well you can, you can come up with a cool little mechanic and make and make a little game based around that and you know that's your arcade game but it can get bloated really quickly and transform into all kinds of other stuff yeah but i think you know one of the things like we'd like to make more shmups but maybe take some things from shmups and put in 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 different styles game of games, you know. Um, I know we've talked about doing like a little platformer or something like that. I don't know. Got to figure yeah, out. Yeah, it would be next. cool to try putting um, really dense bullet patterns into other genres and mm-hmm. see what happens. Yeah, like kind of like a, I want to be the guy type thing, maybe. But a little yeah, more. maybe. Um, ho- hopefully, a little bit less infuriating <laughs> than that game. Uh, yes. <laughs> But yeah, maybe a I control a metal slug game. Oh um, hell yeah! Can't go wrong with, with a running gun. Yeah, a bullet bullet hell running gun might be fun. Any yeah, other I think any other like questions? Some... Chat. I would love to see more bullet hell style running guns. That's I think that is an underexplored sort of subgenre. Yeah, where you can see your hitbox. That would be a help as well. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there, are, yeah. there are things, you know, like you can do bullet cancelling and and uh, bullet time and all sorts of stuff in different sort of genres. I, I don't know. It, it's, yeah, we've got a few different ideas. It's just deciding on which one we're going to do next. Also, the thing about shmups is that there's there is an, it's a genre and there is an audience for it. Uh, if you make like a, a single screen game or a top down sort of game or something, you know, I don't really know. If you do another game, it has to be of a certain type of genre, I think, so that you can at least market it. Oh, Blossom had a good question. How do you sort of battle the old, you know, uh, Steam, especially with their new refund system and everything of, oh, the game's just 20 minutes long, I feel ripped off, you know, the old IGN reviews or whatever it was, like, oh, the game's only 20 minutes. I mean, are you really getting your money's worth? I've talked about this a lot on my channel and how that's all BS, but it, it, are there things you can do in game, like a Blossom suggested, maybe like the character unlocks or things like that? Something to sort of uh, signal to players who might think this way, okay, hold on, you didn't actually beat the game. T- take it easy. <laughs> like Yeah, ha- uh, having some kind of um, in-game or in-menu indicator about how much of the game you have really completed is definitely helpful. Like, yeah. um, I think some kind of percentage there, or like in Star Hunter, you can see right on the character select screen if you haven't got through enough of the game, then one, yeah. two out of three characters are locked. So every time you go there, even if you did manage to get through quite a bit of the game, and you'll on... see, no, there's more to do. And on your end, is that a thing with shmups that you have to deal with on Steam? Or is that, does that not really come up? Like, you, you like say, you release it on Steam, and then you see like 12% of people played it for, I can't remember what the limit is, right? It's like two hours or something. Played it for like an hour, 50 minutes and returned it. Like, is that a thing or is that not really that much of an issue? Um, So far, fortunately, it hasn't been that much of an issue for us, but that's be- largely because we don't allow unlimited continues. Yeah, very true, very true. And I th- I think anyone making a, a traditional smart food did not do that. But the only reason that works is in an arcade environment when you have money. An obvious, yeah, exactly, an obvious disincentive to keeping on um, going past uh, your, your the depth that you're comfortable with and you want to go back and practice because the more you go out of your comfort zone, the more frequently you're going to have to pay and the more money you will waste. But once you take away the actual arcade, like the, yeah, the, the physical arcade environment, and you leave all of the infinite um, continues in, then you'll just make a game which people can blast through in half an hour. And I think they're actually right to feel shortchanged because you shouldn't have to impose your own special house rules 
right. just to make the game fun. Yeah, very true. If, the, if you die and the game says, please continue, and then it gives you all of your weapons back, then it's actively encouraging you to play in a way that's just not fun. That's so I think true. that's a, a pitfall that a lot of um, indie shmups or, or just uh, arcade style indie games in general fall into uh, because they'll say, oh, well, this is arcade accurate. And they're right, it is. But the only reason that element of the game design works is because of the real arcade. Once you take that away, you should also take away unlimited continues. Or again, you're just actively encouraging people to play the game in a way that's not fun and will give them uh, bad value for money. Not to give any developers any bad ideas, but I think this would be funny, okay? Is if you had a system <laughs> where if you continued, you have to pay like 25 cents, like in the arcade. It's like a little microtransaction. That was a, I actually, I, no, uh, we discussed this. I remember <laughs> talking about this in the casino arcade, like with Xbox Live. It's like, couldn't we do a game where it costs 10p a go? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like you download it. And to, like theoretically, you could do that. Uh, yeah. If the system was set up, it costs I mean, you, credit. You, to you totally could, because <laughs> yeah. uh, my, my, a lot of games now have um, <laughs> in-app purchases and things for cosmetics. Yeah. Except instead of a cosmetic, you'd be buying a credit, and then it would be even more arcade accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm done. With it. I that, think you know you could buy a game. You could get be the fun. first. Continue. You could get the first credit is always free, but then if you want to continue during the game. <laughs> I think you could get away with that on mobile. You know, you could. I don't think you could get away with that on PC, but I'm pretty sure you could get away with that on mobile. I, I think the yeah, much more annoying monetization systems on mobile. Um, I, I'm still not sure about ch charging per play on a on console. Like <laughs> yeah, I don't think that would work out too well. You might you might get publicity from like Kotaku or something because they're all mad at you. Arcade accurate. <laughs> arcade accurate. Um, pay to win, yeah, literally. Experience. Pay to win. That's yeah, the most literal know. pay to win there is. Yeah. But yeah, we, we haven't really had any refund issues on Steam because again, we, we don't think you should have unlimited continues. Yeah. And simply by doing that, we've we let people know that they can't blast through the game in half an hour and then refund it yeah i think also Unless having that practice good. mode in there is yeah jamers could but yeah, yeah. i think uh... he, he's also into scoring though i think anyone that is good enough to finish it on their first try would also want to is into the into the genre enough that they don't want to just refund it after that they want to really right. dig into it yeah very true and, uh, oh my gosh, I just lost the thread of what I was going to say. It was, oh yeah, the practice mode. I think the practice mode fully justifies that too, where people could say, oh, well, I'm not talented enough to clear the game, you know, without, continu without massive continues and everything. The practice mode, the inclusion of the practice mode really helps with that. Cause it's like, Hey, just practice in practice mode. Then you'll, you'll get it. Yeah. We've had a lot of good feedback, um, from, from reviews about the practice mode. No one has said that the game was frustrating or unfair. Um, when when you die, you get funny quotes from the Grim Reaper who will come up <laughs> and let you let you know what you should be doing, um, which also helps take the the sting out of death. And then there's a very extensive practice mode. And I think that's another real key thing. To yeah, have I remember home, when I console. reviewed and... Space Moth DX forever ago. I was impressed that you guys had as robust of a practice mode as you did at the time, because that wasn't as common back then. Like the, some shmups came out, no practice mode, you know, on in, on Steam and everything. So yeah, you guys have always been good about that. But Space Moth, Space Moth DX had um, a, a kind of a, a save state style continue system where, right. you know, you couldn't actually have a normal continue on it. And that was our way of getting around just credit feeding through the game. So if you reach the boss, a uh, stage three boss with one life and two bombs and you game over on it, you would you get the option to restart the boss with one life and two bombs. Yeah, that's, that's um, cool. But we've, we, we've, got away, we've done away with that with uh, the new version. We, we just thought it's simpler just to give people three continues on Star Hunter and three continues. Three continues is enough to get, you know, 
to right. get a good way into the game for most people. Yeah. And you know, you'll get a clear. Mode. Yeah. Yeah, the old system was effectively save states. Yeah. Um, but under state. a different name. Yes. It's pretty cool. Um, but I could see yeah, why it, it could be tricky for people to understand what's going on. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah, it was a bit difficult to um, um, to describe quickly, um, and also it meant that you could accidentally force yourself into a corner, as it were. Where if you went on, then because you entered the stage of the boss battle low on resources, it was it just became exponentially harder to, to keep on going. Right. Um, so for Lunar Edition, the new version of Space Moth, we've gone with three continues like Star Hunter. That's awesome. Yeah, well, thanks so much for joining you two. It was a lot of fun talking to you about the games and the history and everything like that. I wanted to do a little bit more of a robust style interview than, you know, typical when's the release date type of stuff that you, <laughs> that you tend to get in, in uh, interviews, you know. What, how did you yeah, guys thanks, prank each other happened. during development? What, what were the great you know, behind-the-scenes <laughs> pranks that you guys did? Pranks? You know, those types, <laughs> those types of, That's more of a Hollywood thing, but that always, that always makes me laugh. If you watch like old Hollywood uh, interviews, they'd always ask about pranks every, every time. Well, there wasn't that much chance for that because we basically, uh, with Scott, we did it over Skype. We kind of made Star Hunter over Skype. So when the pandemic hit, it kind of didn't really affect how we sort of worked. Right. So I would occasionally go around James's place and, you know, but not that often. It was, you know, like was change, not the, change the keyboard functions on his computer. So he presses yeah. Z and it's an X <laughs> and all that sort of thing. <laughs> Too, too much risk of accidentally deleting the project. Yeah, yes. God, no, like, yeah. <laughs> control X becomes control delete. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I I don't think there were that many pranks, unfortunately. Um, like Dan was saying, we've we made pretty much the whole thing remotely. Um, so that there wasn't too too much chance to prank each other. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have as many stories about that. But the upside is, when the pandemic hit, we didn't have to completely change the way we were working. It was right. just, just keep rolling. Business carries on. We just keep, keep on rolling. rolling. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got it all completed and out on consoles. I'm I'm hoping this becomes more of a trend for indie shmups coming out that they come out on consoles. As much of a pain as I sure it is, I sure I'm sure that it is to put them on there. I just think it really helps the genre get out to people who would never come across it otherwise. Yeah, I mainly play shops on PC now, but there are certainly a lot of people that prefer consoles, especially Switch. Well, I think it's also um, just I great discoverability a... on the console. You know what I mean? Like, if you get it on the eShop, it's just less crowded versus, like, Steam and everything like that. There's, like, oh, absolutely, chance. yeah. V visibility um, on Steam is is extremely low at the moment mm -hmm. and you get you stand a much higher chance of being noticed on console exactly not to mention just reaching more people which is always good yeah well awesome okay everyone well y'all's homework is to go out and grab a copy of S star hunter and keep an eye out for space moth lunar edition because i'm really excited for that and thanks so much for joining you do it's out on the, well, it's out on PS4 and Xbox on Thursday, I think. Is that right, James? Yeah, that's right. Oh, it should nice. Should be up on Thursday. Yeah. Oh I yeah. Do you have be any? Weird. Before we leave, do you guys yeah. have any other plugs or anything you want to let people know about? No, I mean that's it. Basically, it should be a backup on the uh, European uh, Nintendo shop uh, next week, hopefully to coincide with the PS4 and Xbox launch. Yeah, um, um, and if anyone likes the sound of the game but they're not sure if it would be for them, there's also a free demo on Steam. Oh, yeah. So you can That's try, cool. try that out and see, see what you think. Well, awesome. We'll sign off, everyone. Adios. Cool. Bye. Cool. Thanks for having us, Mark. Yeah, and no good problem. Luck with your Thanks. Looking forward to playing it once it's done. <laughs> oh, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a thing. That's that's for sure. It'll be that. <laughs> I, I I look forward to the thing, whatever it is. I think more more shmups are good. Well, the idea of it is to create a shmup that never stops ever.
So it's just going to be <laughs> like, you know, when you're in, okay, you guys are cave players, right? You know, like stage five in all cage ga- uh, cave games where it just goes nuts. That, yeah. but 60 yeah. minutes long. Like, that's the idea. And it just never stops, <laughs> like, ever. <laughs> Even between, like, I want to have it to where you fight the boss. And then as you're fighting the boss, the next stage starts as you're, like, right at the end of the boss fight. And so, like, I just want it to be the most insane shmup out there. Like, that's one of my goals. <laughs> oh, I so, see. Yeah. So there's no stage breaks in it. It's no, just one no. long. Yes. Oh, no see. stage breaks. Yeah. No breaks between that, patterns. That actually, um, that actually sounds kind of like what um, what I'd expect you to make, but in yes. a good way. So now you're really keen on gameplay density. Yes, that's it. JMT, don't waste the player's time. Right. I just wanted to so see. If I was making it's, like a, the most Mark MSX shmup I could. Yes, exactly. Then yeah, I just chop out everything. Like stage transition, who needs it? Yeah. Slap on the next stage. Yes, the boss, exactly. When I have a boss on top of the boss. Two exactly. A- and, and I wanted to have like an insane enemy count. So everything has low HP, but there's like thousands of enemies in the stage. I just want it to be like <laughs> just waves and waves and waves of enemies. And then I've added in always like this slight randomization to everything because my, my goal is to try and break Jamers at least a little bit, like make him sweat. Be like, okay, I can't just route out this game. I have to actually dodge shit. Even if I don't want to, like that's the kind of goal of the game is because one thing that's always kind of funny is when you watch super players play like, cave games and they're really freaking good at them even really hard ones they get the routing so precise that when you watch it as a casual viewer you're like wow this doesn't look too bad and then you play it and you realize how hard it is i kind of want to make a shmup that visually looks insane no matter what you do no matter how good you are the shmup is just going to be nutballs crazy like that's kind of the goal so i don't think it'll be that commercially viable but i i just want to show it to the shmup players and see just get their reactions to it because I think that'd be fun. Well, you'd have to, I, I you'd think have it to... sounds cool. I, I want to play this. Now. <laughs> you'd have to you'd have to add like ran, uh, like um, randomness to everything, wouldn't you? you yeah, you there's have there's the same thing happen. All, yeah, there's every, slight every time. randomness to everything. Like I, for instance, yeah. there's this one attack that you begin the game. I've got the first few minutes of the game going. You begin the game, and then there's these meteors that fall and they explode. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. You can't shoot them. You you just have to wait for them to fall and explode. And then I add a little bit of a randomness to it. So they'll all explode within like 10 seconds from each other. So they may be, you know, plus or minus five seconds, they'll explode. So you can never, or maybe it's like three seconds. But yeah, each run, run to run will look different every single time because the enemies kind of will like undershoot sometimes, they'll overshoot other times. Like everything has this slight bit of randomness to the AI. So that's that's kind of the goal. Well, this is now shot up to the top of my anticipated <laughs> shmups list. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm going to be showing, uh, after I get stage one, I'm going to start showing footage of it so people can at least see what it looks like as I'm going. Cool. Oh yeah, that will be that will be super cool to follow the follow the development. Yeah, so Let's see if you uh, ma- manage to make Jameis and the other super players sweat. <laughs> yes, that's the idea. That's the idea, or to make them mad at least, to make them mad at uh, mad at the game. Like, what the, what is this? <laughs> what is this madness? <laughs> try try and make it fair, but try and just push the boundaries of what is fair and what is obnoxious. Like that's kind of the idea. But anyway. Uh, enough about my uh, the shmup. I'm I'm actually working on it quite a bit. People don't know that. Like a lot, of th- I'm spending a good amount of hours every day working on it. But does, does it have a, a code name it's or, in, or a project title or yeah, is House it of just, Bullets? Um, House of Bullets is the the code name for it. That's good. I like that because I I'm a fan of the book House of Leaves. Have you ever read that book? No, I uh, no, I don't think so. Oh well, in House of Leaves, it's actually a really good book. It uh it there's this house and it's sort of like randomly haunted in this sort of interesting way where they open the doors and the doors kind of open to another dimension or something like that but then it creates this sort of randomized maze that they go and explore and it it just keeps going deeper and deeper into like nothingness into the abyss and so i was like oh that's kind of like the idea behind the game is like the deeper you get into it it's just supposed to be more and more insane the further you get 
and like that it, it wants to push you into madness <laughs> like in the, in the <laughs> book like everyone at the end of the book ends up insane because of this maze they get put into so that's the idea house of bullets it's supposed to just be more and more insane to the point where you're like this is absolutely absurd so so the book sounds like i'm a horror title right yeah well it's sort of a horror sort of it's like one of those genres of many types like it, it's got a lot going on in it it's a really good book though one mm. of my favorites would the game um would, would house of bullets have a kind of horror theme like mm. uh i wanted the, the smiles, maybe i wanted it to be uh, a theme of like biblical shit like that's what i, I wanted like demons and angels mm. and priests and like all that kind of stuff but unfortunately i have no artistic abilities at all and so most of the visual theming is going to be incredibly eclectic and strange because i'm using like assets from all these like from itch.io and all these different places and working in my own weird ones so the the visuals of it are going to be nutballs crazy too because it's not going to make a whole lot of sense <laughs> like this thing is a... maybe a kind of um I'm I'm trying to there was what is it there's there's a glitch art schmuck. Um, oh yeah, it's not that crazy. Yeah. It actually kind of reminds me of like a a weird Toho game at this phase. Like like it doesn't feel that off from like a Toho sort of style as far as the visuals because like the first stage one background I just finished it's kind of cool. It's this sort of um mountain. But I had this effect where it fades into red. So, like, the entire stage, as it progresses, goes from kind of like a clear blue day to, like, a blood red by the end of it. And it's mm -hmm. sort of like one of those Toho-style backgrounds I'm talking about, where it's just kind of, hey, there's a background back there. It's not really as intricate as uh, the cave backgrounds and stuff. But yeah, I should well, I'm, be, I'm definitely in the next few weeks, be showing stage one at least. Let people oh, cool. let people try it out a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I I will definitely follow um the the development of House House of Bullets. I'm glad in, to hear in my it. mind it, it looks kind of like um oh I've remembered the name now Rim Nine Thousand, the glitch art schmuck. Oh um no it, it looks quite a bit different than that but you'll see. But oh, well, it'll, I'm, it'll I'm play definitely gonna gonna chain in when when we get our first look at it. Yeah, I'm hoping within the next month or so to get stage one alpha done, I guess. Nice. Stage one, you did a video on that. Stage one is the hardest stage to to make in a game. I think. Yes, except I'm kind of cheating because I'm not following the traditional rules That's of true. shmupping where you're supposed to have like some kind of difficulty curve. The, the curve of the yeah. game is just insane to more insane. So um, like when in doubt, I just look at it, I'm like, more enemies more enemies <laughs> that's like that's like my mantra like i'm i'm like oh there's not enough enemies just add more more enemies bombs like more bullets so that's always kind of the rule <laughs> as i go through and design just m dense denser make it more there's three seconds of downtime that's too much downtime we need more bullets like <laughs> that's how it's going so, so it's less a difficulty curve and more like um a difficulty wall but the wall is also slowly falling back on you yes exactly that's that's exactly right there's not a curve really it's just a, a wall of difficulty for 16 minutes see if you can handle it that's kind of it it's not that's what i was saying like this game that's why i was saying i'd probably release it first on itch because the most people who will buy it are like people who watch my channel like there's very small likelihood it'll have that much of a commercial appeal because it's going to be so damn insane like, maybe that could be the selling point though. It could be, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, something like uh, get, getting a fruit with better funny could be the, the schmuck version of that. And then you can have a yeah, like the uh, real and fake rage from I want to be the guy type of <laughs> I want to be the guy type of thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks so much for joining. It's been a lot of fun talking to you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for having me. And thanks everyone cool. for tuning in.